Blows from Grambling and North Carolina A&T are threatening to derail Jockway Nunley's historic season. Meanwhile, Norfolk State hopes to trigger some kind of offense, either by the air or on the ground. The Spartans will try to load it up and move a little something something today as Florida A&M comes to town for Mia College Football Saturday. It's a great day for football, and it's the Rattlers of FAMU invading Spartan Country, Norfolk State, Dick Price Stadium, and what a game. Two teams that are basically saying, where is my game? We've got to get back on track. Two teams coming off losses, North Carolina A&T beating the Rattlers of FAMU last week, and Hampton putting it on Norfolk State. Yes, everyone's looking forward to it, including Quinn Gray. We'll talk about him a little later, a young man who's trying to find his confidence. Hello, everybody. I'm Ronnie Duncan, and once again, welcome to me at College Football Saturday. When you speak of this rivalry, they've only played three times, but of course, two years ago, there's something that the Norfolk State fans shall never forget, losing 84-14 to 14 to FAMU. Since FAMU is on the downslide, at least losing two in a row, I'm sure Norfolk State would like to get in their licks. And guess what? They're undefeated at home. Who knows about the home full advantage? My homie, Mark Gray. Good to be with you as always, Ronnie. You're absolutely right. This is a place, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, that Norfolk State is trying to protect. It is their house. Big win over South Carolina State last week. It got interest back around here. This would be a huge win. It is a big, big opportunity for this program. Speak of Norfolk State, you've also got to include FAMU. The reason why FAMU has lost two games in a row, most recently to North Carolina A&T. It happened last week on our MEAC College Football Saturday. Take a look at some of the numbers, Mark, because they can impress you, and then, of course, they can depress you. Boy. When you talk about 48 points a game to what 10 points a game, they last two. And you look at the passing yards. They're almost losing 100 yards now per game, and they're turning the ball over. Florida A&M still has a very talented crew of skilled players. They have a great quarterback, but... But they are really out of sync, working really well, but they're turning the ball over, and Quinn Gray has got to be looking for answers right now. We're going to talk about Quinn Gray a little bit later, but you know what? When you speak of the defense here at Norfolk State, there's one guy who impressed me against South Carolina State, number 57, Von McAfee. Simply a beast. This guy is great in run support. He's aggressive in blitz packages, and he also does a great job in coverages. This guy is a relentless workhorse on the defensive side of the football, and he simply can do it all. He is a great linebacker, and safe for the crew at North Carolina A&T, you can make an argument that Mar Von McAfee might be the best pure one-on-one -on -one linebacker in the conference. Well, Von McAfee's confidence is up. One young man's confidence is down. I'm speaking of Quinn Gray. Number 17. He is the quarterback for FAMU. As Quinn Gray goes, so do the Rattlers. And he is the captain of the ship. I mean, this is a guy who, when they're operating at maximum offensive efficiency, he is one of the best quarterbacks in all of one double A. But you see, breakdowns in the offensive line have produced turnovers. And Quinn Gray is playing right now like he doesn't have a lot of confidence in his O-line. And consequently, that lack of confidence is sort of manifesting itself in the overall play of the Florida A&M offense right now. They would see, like to see plays like that from Jacque Nunley and Quinn Gray. What a connection. When you speak of the quarterback on the other side, that's John Roberts, a young man who's a transfer from New Mexico. If his receivers hold on to the ball, he's got some huge numbers in the MEAC. He's really got the talent to be a star quarterback in this league, but you're right. A quarterback needs players around him to step up, and as we saw in South Carolina State's game a couple of weeks ago, when the receivers stepped up, they made big plays. That's why they were able to win. John Roberts is definitely a work in progress. There it is, our U.S. Airways quarterback comparisons. Both of these young men can put the ball up in the air. Some want to fly with a great time. Obviously, they all want to get on U.S. Airways, but when you look at the numbers there, Quinn Gray, John Roberts, two quarterbacks that definitely will be the character of their team. And when it all ends, it will end with one of these individuals. Gray has to do a better job of field generalship in this game, not force the situations, make good reads and good passes. John Roberts, on the other hand, just has to direct a steady offense. Who's going to find their game? It's how me at College Football Saturday 2000. It's FAMU in Norfolk State.
Welcome back to Dick Price Stadium here in Norfolk, Virginia. Norfolk State playing host to Florida A&M. Joining me right now is the head coach for the Rattlers, Billy Joe, and coach. Two team, uh, two losses in a row to your team. How do you bounce back from that? Well, uh, we are uh, focused today. Uh, we're committed and disciplined and energized to, to really get it done today. Uh, we know that if we can just get a victory, it would cure all the ills of our program at this time. When you talk about your offense right now, it seems as if they've been struggling the last two ball games. First five, they're absolutely awesome. Can you get them back on track in this one? Well, uh, yes, we just have to eliminate these turnovers. In the last two games, we've had nine turnovers. In the first uh, five games, we only had eight. So uh, turnovers is a problem. If we can eliminate these uh, turnovers, I think we'll be competitive today. Thank you very much. Good luck to you in this ball game. Thanks very much, George. Okay, thanks Billy Joe, the head coach of Florida a and back up to you guys. Well, thanks a lot. And we're ready to get going, George, because fam, you won the toss and declined, giving the ball to Norfolk State to receive. So we will see the Spartans on the offense first. Set to receive. Back there in the backfield is Chad Smith. And he is an explosive one, Ronnie. Averaging over 21 yards on kickoff returns for the season. And Norfolk State would love the prospects of shrinking the field for their sputtering offense. Smith is back there along with Ben Anderson, number three. We're set to get ready for me at College Football Saturday. 2000 FAMU taking on Norfolk State. And that's going to be a touchback. Now for your USPS, Norfolk starting lineups. And it looks like this, LaShawn Mack, one of the best there is at left tackle. And Johnson is also huge at the right tackle. Moving along in that offensive lineup, they continue to get better each and every week. And Mo Forte has to be happy with what he's seeing there. Also, look at that, Charles Burnett. Here's a young man, number 80. If he's able to get that ball as a receiver, he's going to play a huge factor in this game. Yeah, Burnett leads the team with 14 catches for 280 yards, but he's averaging about 88 yards per game. He's the big play receiver in this offense. John Roberts, the quarterback, to give the Smith a gain of four yards. A rather good beginning to this drive, Ronnie. Now taking time for that USPS starting defense. And I'm talking about the Rattlers, and there he is, Mr. Daly, one of the best there is. Parsons there, Scott and Bird. Here's the real tough part for the FAMU defense, the linebackers. Nakia Bynum starting for Pat Burroughs. He's got to have a big game. Darnell Vickers and Troy Hart, two solid corners. Those are the United States Postal Service starting lineups for both teams. Second down to give the Smith, but once again, he's brought down. But he was able to gain three yards on the place. Now, let's check out this ISO coming up. Right here, Daly is going to be double teamed and is going to play off and explode between there. Look at that. That's a great job of playing off the block once again to string it out. The back goes up inside him, and he runs right back into containment. Solid effort that time. Obviously understanding that the preseason All-American is a force to be reckoned with, though he was neutralized last week. Third down, four yards to go. Ball on the 26-yard line for the Spartans of Norfolk State. Roberts back to pass. Roberts under pressure, and Roberts is brought down. The reason why the defense swarming all over them, and I'm talking FAMU, John Battle on the hit. Battle comes through on a blitz. It's a stunt where he comes from the outside. Now watch, the double team right here. It's a one-on-one -on -one situation when you've got your big offensive lineman going against the All-American. That opens up a lane for the linebacker to shoot the gap and sack the quarterback. And let's be real for a second. When you talk about offensive woes, it starts in the middle of the O-line for North Norfolk State. Terry Cornett is going to punt away. He's going to punt this one from the two-yard line, set to receive Isaac Brown, number two. Cornett out of Columbus, Ohio, Independence High School. This young man loves to play the game. And let's see exactly where the officials were down that one. It looked like Brown may have touched it at the 45. Boy, he's living dangerous, and we have a flag on the play as well. So suddenly the late flag comes out, Ronnie. But, I mean, he's living very dangerously for a team that's been struggling to hold on to the football. I'm sure Coach Billy Joe had to, uh, his heart probably skipped a beat just a little bit. Me at College Football Saturday coming to you live from William Dick Price Stadium. Ronnie Duncan, Mark Gray, and George Johnson on the sidelines bringing you the game, all the action, and all the great time. That's our head man, our referee, Sam Jones. Uh, 
Sam Jones a Hall of Famer in his own right, huh? Hey, I tell you what, that Sam Jones went to North Carolina Central. Now let's take a look at the other part of our USPS fam you offense and you see it there Kevin Johnson the starting center in today's game and he's replacing Terry Logan Logan will see some time on the special teams unit Nunley of course in his pursuit of history we will talk a lot about him as the game develops and there's Quinn Gray the man on the spot uh, this afternoon Gray out of the shotgun high snap Gray back to pass finds Jacque Nunley Nunley across the 45 yard line to the 46. And now you're seeing in that particular play what Florida A&M wants to do, but the difference between this Florida A&M team and the last two seasons. We're talking greater detail about that as uh, the plays develop. Now for the Norfolk State starting defensive lineup, and there he is, Devorius Carnes, a young man who plays huge. Number 57, we highlight him at the beginning of the game, anchoring those linebackers. And Marcus Gray, a freshman last year who has become a tremendous sophomore at safety. Quinn Gray back to pass, second down. Pass is incomplete. Gray gets the pressure. The reason why? Najee right there. Najee was in his face, and he wasn't able to fully extend his arms. But on the previous play, we saw Jacque Nunley take a short pass, and he was basically contained. In the past couple of seasons, he's been so dangerous after the catch. Florida A&M's other receivers are not really clearing anybody out right now, so it's making it difficult for him to run after the catch. Second and four, ball on the 44-yard line, and O.J. Mark strikes his board bound, and that was the Boreas Carnes. Boy, Carnes plays off, shoots the gap, and gets March Banks around the legs. And you know something? Florida A&M's run game last week was virtually non-existent. The previous two games, March Banks had over 100 yards. Last week, he was held to somewhere in the neighborhood of 30. Chad Smith is set to receive. He's at the 10-yard line. T.J. Smith will be doing your punting for the FAMU Rattlers. Boy, he took a lick last week trying to bring down a uh, Romando North. Running from the 37-yard line. Ball is up. And this ball is going to be down inside the five. We're going to take a break in the action. It's first quarter action. FAMU taking on Norfolk State. Dick Price Stadium. MEAC College Football Saturday. We're scoreless for now. Getting acquainted with each other. Chad Smith, number four, right there, got acquainted with one of the Florida AM gentlemen on the opposite side. And as you can say, Mr. Brooks, nice to meet you. What a fine weather we're having this afternoon. Let's play two. That was a 46 yard punt that put that ball on the three yard line by TK Smith. So that'll make it first and 10 from the three for John Roberts. Aaron Culpepper in the backfield along with Damian Smith. Smith brings it out for about a two-yard gain. Did you see that little off-tackle action like that, Ronnie? That was a play that was so effective last week with Maurice Hicks. And what was happening was that at the point of attack, a and was blasting Florida A&M between the A and the B gaps. Coach George Ragsdale talks about that. They think Florida A&M is vulnerable to the rush game. To this point, they haven't broken yet, but they will continue to pound until the uh, score dictates otherwise. Ball on the four-yard line, second down, eight yards to go. Damian Smith picked up two yards on the play. Mo Forte, the coach of Northern State. Smith again, nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. FAMU Rattler defense was there to greet him. Boy, just a surge, a swarming defensive effort that time by Florida A&M. And uh, to this point, Damian Smith has been contained. And you would think that without a Pat Burroughs in the middle, that Norfolk State would find it a little bit easier to jumpstart the run game, but third downs have not been a pretty sight here on the Virginia Bay for Norfolk this season. Third and eight. Ball still on the four-yard line. John Roberts, transfer from New Mexico. A young man who's a lefty who has plenty of potential. Roberts turning out. Back of pass intercepted. And that was hard. That was set up, Ronnie, by Anthony Cola's blitz on a stunt coming right through the middle. And then it was picked off by Troy Hart, number five on the year. Watch. The blitz comes, and on the half row, Roberts tries to get outside. So he has to release it a little early, doesn't get enough on it. And Hart steps in front of the receiver and almost takes it to the house. So the turnovers, which have plagued Florida and them over the last couple of weeks, now give them an opportunity to get on the board first. Bam, you are there for wide receivers in the game. March Banks is the only man in the backfield. The quarterback is Quinn Gray. 
Ball is on the five yard line. Five yards to the goal. Gray pitches out to March Banks. March Banks. Oh. There's a fumble in the end zone, but he was down at the one yard line, according to the officials. Well, Quinn Gray is not the most fleet of foot quarterback in this conference, and every time he goes out on an option situation like this, if you're a fan, you Rattler fan, you got to be concerned. March Banks does a good job. It was a great read for the pitch that time by Quinn Gray, but the defense was right there. Second down, one yard to go. Touchdown, fam, you. And just like that, Quinn Gray takes it in for the touchdown. The big quarterback, number 17. You know, he's a big fella. Not only can he throw, we showed you in the pregame, he can roll you over as well. He's a load to bring down. He is a physical specimen, is Quinn Gray. And for a team that was, you know, that needed a shot of offense and was hoping to stay away from the potential for an upset, this is a great beginning for Florida a &M. Set for the point after, Juan Vasquez. We've got flags all over the place, Mark. And hey, you want to talk about one of the all-groove performances of the season? Mr. Vasquez last week, <laughs> you talk about a, a silver lining on a cloudy, sunny Tallahassee day. When Bill Hayes tried to ice him at the end of the first half with a three timeouts, and he banged a 44-yard field goal. That's my all-groove kicker for the year right there, baby. All right, he's all-groove. Maybe he'll be all MEAC by the end of the season. Juan Vasquez. The kick up, and the kick is good. It's 7-0, FAMU taking the early lead and taking advantage of the Norfolk State mistakes. We'll come back. MEAC College Football Saturday. It's the Rattlers taking the early roll. The reason why, two plays, five yards, and Quinn Gray was the quarterback. Now let's take a look at our national car rental scoring drive, and it started off with a big interception, Mark. That's right. Roberts was looking for Amos down the sideline. Troy Hart steps off for his fifth pickoff of the season, and Quinn Gray from one yard out takes it to the house, and that's your national car rental scoring drive. Remember, green means go with national car rental. Call 1-800-CAR-RENT or book online at www.nationalcar.com. That was two plays, five yards, it took just 30 seconds, a one-yard touchdown from Quinn Gray. Time to kick it off, and let's see what the Spartans can do on offense. Anderson with the ball at the three-yard line. Anderson still on his feet. Anderson brought down at the 27. Now let's go to George Johnson on the sidelines. George? Well, fellas, I've talked to some of the guys over here at Norfolk State, and they feel that they cannot get behind when it comes to playing Florida A&M. Right now, they are behind, which means they have to pass the football. But the Spartans feel that they can pass pass the football, especially against Florida A&M's zone defense. You see, man-to-man's -man's a little different, but when they play zone, Norfolk State feels that Florida A&M has what they call certain windows. You run a pass route, and you have windows. First window, second window, third window. That third window, a lot of times, is in the middle of the field, and you talked about it, Mark. They feel they can run against Florida A&M in the middle, but they also feel like they can pass the ball against Florida A&M, especially in that zone, in the middle of the field. We'll see if they're able to accomplish that as the game wears on. Back upstairs to you guys. All right, thanks a lot, George. Anderson had a 23-yard return on that kickoff return, and that's why the ball is in that position, making it second and eight from the 27-yard line, and some interesting points made there by George Johnson. He talked about the middle of the field that puts Johnny on the spot, being the key of Bynum and the safeties, and I know that the offensive coordinator of Norfolk is chomping in the bit to try to work the center of the field. It's brought down by Daly. There's a fumble on the ball. And picking it up for the touchdown. The fam, you, Rattlers, all over the ball. Once again, they get it done. Mr. Parsons. Ebby Parsons picks it up and hauls it in. And just like that, Florida A&M has opened up the can early. Relentless, aggressive defenses. The linebacker shooting the gaps. John Roberts takes a shot, lets the football go, and it re results in seven points for Florida A&M. See the blitz coming from the far side. It was Jerron Daly on a stunt. The ball is lying around on the ground. The big D, the big nasty from the end. He picks it up. Rumlin, bumlin, stumlin, touchdown. All right, we're trying for another point after for Juan Vasquez. This would make it 14 to nothing, fam you, if the point after is good. And Mark, do you see signs of last year when fam you came in here and won? And the year before, 84 to 14. Last year in Tallahassee, 56 to 7. 
University. Let's take a look at this touchdown one more time because, Mark, you laid it out. Daly was the man on the pressure on John Roberts. The blitzing of Florida A&M's front seven right now is the difference. They forced a premature pass on the previous possession, and then they forced John Roberts into this fumble. And look at Evie Parsons. Last time he touched the football was, well, probably right then as he takes it into the house. Boy, there's something that will be shown in the Parsons family for 50 years. Grandpa Eppy scored a touchdown on Mayak TV. <laughs> I didn't know he was that big and could run that fast. And Daddy. look at him on the sidelines right now. He's like, man, I had to run real far. <laughs> no, big fella. It was less than 14 yards. <laughs> Sound like Maurice Green after he ran a heat at the U.S. Olympic trials. And on the other side, Mo Hunt, excuse me, Mo Forte has to be concerned right now. This is the nightmare of all nightmares for Coach Forte. His team may have their offensive flexibility thwarted right now. They may have to go into a pass-oriented mode already, and that plays right into the aggressiveness of Florida A&M's hands. 97, final score was 41-26 FAMU. 98, it was 84-14 here at Dick Price Stadium, FAMU. In 1999, it was 56-7, FAMU winning. There are 3-0 and oh in this entire situation of playing of these two teams being together. Remember the commercial about a year or so ago where they were asking uh, if you had whipping in a jar? Well, I think the gel form has been opened already, and if they're not care <laughs> careful, they'll go to the shelf and just open up the can. Man, you are spreading the mess around today, aren't you? 829 left to go in the first quarter. We're about to kick off one more time. Hopefully this time for Norfolk State matters, they can get things going. And that's another touchback. Anderson was going all the way back, and he was like, where way do I go? He wants to go forward. He keeps going back. Boy, I tell you, the kickoffs for this quarter by Florida A&M have been legendary. I mean, you've had, uh, I believe on the previous one, there was a 23-yard return, but this is just absolutely ugly. Consistency has been um, something they've been looking for here at Norfolk State, and these two games with Hampton last week and today's game have been exact microcosms of each other if you're in Norfolk Parks. They have not been able to get off to a good start. First and 10 from the 20-yard line. Smith gains a yard at best. Boy, they've shored up those holes. Or maybe the big nasties on front aren't as nasty as they are in Greensboro right now because of the same play. This is the same play that we saw Maurice Hicks go for about 60 yards on last week. And the linebackers are doing better jobs filling those holes and making the stops at the point of attack. Last week you saw a lot of Florida a and players throwing their shoulders in the hits and he was bouncing off of them. You look at him right now, guys like Daly right there, they're wrapping and locking up the back and bringing him down. Second and nine, ball from the 21-yard line for the Norfolk State Spartans. Roberts back to pass. Roberts under pressure. Roberts had to let it go because Parsons was all over him. The big fella, number 99. I tell you what, Mr. Parsons is finally getting on TV and making it worth the time. Boy, Leon McMillan was the person who that pass was intended for. And I'm going to tell you something. He's lucky he didn't catch it because Nakia Barnum had come from the middle linebacker position all the way to the outside and had his radar lock to just tee off on McMullen. And you get the feeling that out of the corner of his eye, he saw number 52. Mark, there's a saying down there, bring the pain. You see, when you're a linebacker, you want to force that intimidation to those offensive players. Come this way again, young man, and you will get clocked and rocked. Plant the seed so they're thinking about it. Hearing footsteps is what they call it. They're at nine, and a reception is made, but it will not be enough for a first down. And once again, they find themselves punting the ball on the reception, Jeff Hankerson. Hankerson does a good job of climbing the ladder to uh, haul the pass in, but, you know, that's just a confidence booster. I guess after being peppered and fumbling, and throwing an interception. You get back there in the pocket. If you're John Roberts, you just want to complete some kind of pass. He does, but it's not enough for the first down. And here comes... If you listen closely, you can hear the can opener. Oh, if you I listen... I can hear it. Terry Cornett is set to punt. Set to receive Isaac Brown, number two. Little Isaac Brown, and you know what? Before the game, you wouldn't mind turning one downfield for six. However, that ball is going to be down by Vaughn McAfee at the 33-yard line. We'll come back with much more. 14 to nothing. Fam, you leads. They've got the early, you know what, out. It was a 32-game winning streak by one coach. 
Earl Banks of the Morgan State Bears. 32 games in black college football, which is a record till today. 14-0 is our score as FAMU has the early lead over Norfolk State. Look at consistency does indeed pay. I mean, that, that's just a mark of offensive excellence to score over 10 points, double digits in 99 of 100 games. Interception, Marcus Gray. Now, you know something? You remember we were talking about the tennis analogy, unforced error? You're up by 14 points, Quinn. Your team has all the momentum, and you force a pass into double coverage. Bad, de bad decision, pardon me, by an offensive leader. If you aren't absolutely sure you can make that throw, hold it. Fall. Your team is leading. And this is what has to be frustrating. The offensive brain trust of Florida A&M, Coach Billy Joe, and certainly their fans down in Florida. And this guy that hurt this young man's confidence because he is trying to get going. I mean, the defense, practically for all purposes, has scored the last two points, the 14 nothing score that we have right now. First down from the 42nd yard line, Smith. Smith gains a nine yards on the play. Well, that time it looked like the window kind of opened, and uh, Damian Smith was able to climb through and almost pick up a first down. As a matter of fact, he did pick up a first down, and that was a generous spot there. To me, it appeared as if he gained nine on the play, so that will make it first down for the Spartans. Where did they attack? A gap. Right up the cut. Watch it. First and ten from the 33-yard line. Give to Smith. Smith gains three yards on the play. You talk about coming up and run support, stepping up and doing an outstanding job. That's what Carlos Moore does. The freshman out of Tallahassee. Fill that hole. Watch him and run support. He's going to come up. The play is strung to the outside. And there's number 24 filling the hole. A battle downfield between Sellers and I believe that was Troy Hart. One more block, and we could be talking a totally different thing. That was a play we saw to the near side that Hicks took to the house after a fumble last week for AT. Second and seven from the 29-yard line. To give to Aaron Cole Pepper, and Parsons was there to bring him down along with the host of his boys. Well, when they look at that play on the film, the whole offensive line may end up having to run hills or lines or sprints or something. Everybody missed their assignment. You know, Daly was in there leading the charge for Florida A&M from the far side, and on the near side, they had Ebby Parsons, and they were in the offensive backfield about the time Smith got the football. And to make a third and 10 from the 32-yard line, much needed first down. Down. And let's face it, Coach Mo Forte wants to make sure that John Roberts gets this offense under control. You know, we're going to read a little article that was written today in the paper about what he wants to do offensively. I speak of Roberts. Roberts goes high up for Sellers, but little too high. He passed it to the seventh floor, but the pass was on the tenth. Jerron Daly is just everywhere right now, and he is a bad man in the offensive front right now, just wreaking havoc. Nobody picks him up. That's he and Mac. Mac gets beat, schooled, and then that forces Roberts to have to release that pass early, and it's a high pass. So they tried to set up a screen. I'm a guy that likes to get the running backs into the flats in the passing situations, Ronnie. Hey, look. Look, they're going to have to keep a, a running back back there to protect him because Daly and Coda and Parsons are coming unabated to the quarterback almost at will. Terry Cordette set the punt. That was around from the 45-yard line. And it will land for a touchdown. Wow. <laughs> Not quite to the coffin corner, but an outstanding effort. Check out the Florida A&M big plays. It is a big play team that is often known more for their big plays on offense, but it's been a defensive big plays that are the difference right now. The sack of John Roberts to throw out their initial drive, then coming back the Rattler defense forces him to a pass that's picked off by uh, Troy Hart, which sets up their first touchdown. And then once again, Roberts is one, being peppered by Daly. He fumbles. Big Eddie Parsons picks it up, takes it to the house. That's why Florida A&M is leading right now by 14. All right. Najee Jamal in on the stop of O.J. Mark Banks while we were away. It was a game of nothing. So that will make it second and 10 from the 20-yard line. 
Marchbanks this time gets a first down. Marchbanks still on his feet across the 35, stopped at the 38-yard line. When you can pass as well as Florida A&M does, and you're vulnerable in defensive backfield, you will be susceptible for the bulk of the afternoon to the draw plays, and that's exactly what happened on that. We'll cross them up from a scheme standpoint, and Marchbanks does a good job. Marchbanks is solid, man. It was just that the A&T defense last week was just all over him. 16 yards gained on that play. Pass is complete. T.J. Hines, and that's a first down. I guess he's the heir apparent to Jaquay Nunley, because when you look at the stats, Nunley has 58 catches this season. Hines is number two at 25. Runs disciplined routes, has good hands, is solid after the catch. That was a 12-yard reception. Ball at the 48-yard line. Make it first and 10 for the Rattlers. March Banks. And Quinn Gray coming out of the shotgun, audibleizing, changing the play. And that's one thing Quinn Gray can do. We'll talk more about it in just a second. Gray out of the shotgun, looking for the pass, looking down high. Pass is incomplete. That time, Quinn Gray went up high, looking for his man and wasn't able to find him, Marcos Jr. Sometimes you look at quarterbacks, and if you use a pitching analogy, they just don't have their good stuff. You know, able to take a little bit off, to lead receivers, to make the, the route, the pass in between the zone coverages. Quinn Gray just doesn't have his good stuff right now. All right, second and ten, ball from the 47. And when you talk about good stuff, you're talking about those touch passes. You know, the ability to find a receiver who has a step down the far sideline. He's got the arm to do it. He just has not been able to do it consistently over the last three weeks. And against good, aggressive defensive teams, you have to take advantage of the mistakes, especially when they blow coverages. And that's the burden of the quarterback. We're still in the first quarter, three minutes and 47 seconds left to play. FAMU has taken advantage of the huge mistakes made by the Spartans, if you're just joining us. Ronnie Duncan, Mark Gray, and George Johnson on the sideline. Once again, out of the shotgun, Quinn Gray back to pass. Gray can't find a receiver intended for T.J. Hines. Now let's take a look at our officiating crew for today. The referee is Sam Jones. The umpire is Will Little. Ted White is your hit linesman. Mike Pavis is your line judge. Your side judge is Rusty Acne, Rod Pearson, and Art Williams. And we had a little, a late flag. Sam Jones making the call. That is your referee for this game. Getting a little testy on the inside. See how it develops. Wow. There was a shot that probably, you know, it's a good thing that Jamal Najee is not Galata. Because that was the kind of cheap shot up under the fight that if Galata was on the offensive, defensive front, he probably would have quit. He's been headed to the showers right now. Well, after 14-0, Galata would have left. Yeah, that's by true. <laughs> so the Spartans are putting up a much better fight than I saw last night. What is Galata like, you know, French for a big-time quitter? Oh, okay. The guy's from Poland, so I guess it's Polish for big time losing it, huh? I'll let you live with that. All right. He didn't make $2 million. He stole money. <laughs> One of, you know something? I'm trying to figure out right now in the world of sports, greater feet. A lot of people last night. Jawan Howard for what he's been doing with the Washington Wizards. I think Jawan Howard. Okay. Not by much, though. Not by much. But then again, Juwan plays, what, 81 games, 82 games during the regular season? Well, actually, he plays about 21 games. Oh, okay. Good enough. We'll continue. Third and 25. <laughs> Ball is on the 32-yard line. Quinn Gray back to pass. Gray still on his feet. But Gray is brought back and brought down and brought down the size and the reason why he can't get away from Mr. Carnes. Carnes Tavorius. is the man. You know what? Tavorius does not look like he has a tremendous amount of speed, does not look like he has a great athletic ability, but the big fella says, don't let my size deceive you. Look at his footwork. I mean, he played <laughs> off the block, gave him a little move, gave him like a bit of a head slap to find Gray, who all he needed to do to pick up the first down was get past Carnes. All right, set to receive is Chad Smith on the punt. Once again, Fam U is punting. We'll see if the Spartans can unravel the Rattlers. T.J. Smith, he picked it up at the 19. And brought down at the 29-yard line. Well, well, now, if the offensive line 
I'm sure they got a stern tongue lashing from their position coach because right now in the trenches, the battle that was so overwhelmingly and look, before that, let's look at this stick. Boy, you, woo, we. Florida A&M is definitely coming into this game with the express purpose of getting out some pent-up fr frustrations. And Lorenzo Johnson just took a couple of weeks worth of frustration out on Chad Smith. Woo! Talk about bringing the funk. A punt return, 11 yards. The punt was 39 yards by T.K. Smith. Up. First and 10 from the 29-yard line. They give the Smith. Damian Smith is brought down. Holy it's not too early to make your holiday plans in the Sheridan Norfolk Waterside Hotel. I invite you to visit or stay downtown in Norfolk's one and only Waterfront Hotel. From November 17th through January 6th, subject to date availability, we're offering great holiday room rates as low as $69 plus tax per night. Taking all the great holiday sights, sounds, and shopping and attractions of downtown Norfolk. Call 1-800-325-3535 or 757-622-6666. Six four to make your plans. Second and nine. Once again, that's pressure. Wow. Pass intended for yeah. Sellers, and maybe yeah. you can say Sellers says you can't do that to me. Well, you're absolutely right. You can't. After five yards, you can have no contact with the receiver, and in that situation, Sequan Doe had his hand and was effectively shooting a bow into the rib area of Sellers, who was trying to run a post pattern. See, the pressure up front right now, Ronnie, from Florida A&M's defensive front, and particularly front seven. You see the disappointment and the disdain that they're playing with after, frankly, being embarrassed last week. They're getting incredible pressure, and when, even when the receivers who are locked up in that situation one-on-one, -on -one, they basically are in good shape because the pressure up front right now is really the story in this game by Florida a and Ball on the 45-yard line, first and 10, 14-0. Fam U with the lead, but the Spartans are trying to threaten to get across into the territory of the Raptors. And there he is, the quarterback, John Roberts, in pushback. Well, Florida a and going after the football right now. For a second there, it looked like that ball was about ready to be dislodged as Roberts was coming to the near sideline, but he didn't force anything that down. Troy Hart was there on the tackle. Roberts trying to get some extra yardage, and it appears he's going to have to make it second from the 45, second and 10. Didn't gain any, didn't lose any. And, you know, that's basically what you want your quarterback to do if he's a freshman. You know, make a few big plays, but don't make any big plays that lead to even bigger situations for the opposition, but they need to discuss it. All right, we've got a timeout in the action. 125. It's 14 nothing. Fam U with the lead over Norfolk State. There's much more to come. Stay with us. Be at College Football Saturday. Great fashion. They had only scored 20 points in their last two games. 10 against Grambling, 10 against North Carolina A&T. Already in the first quarter, they own a 14 to nothing lead over the Spartans of Norfolk State. A minute 25 remaining in the first quarter. John Roberts back to pass. Finds Sellers, and Sellers is hit and met. And Sellers is down. Next three games coming up. Me at College Football Saturday is with Dune Cookman. I'm looking forward to that. Taking on North Carolina A&T. It is the Aggies' home coming, but it gives us a chance to see one of the most exciting players in the MEAC and Patel Troutman. Then you've got the fourth. It's Patel Troutman Again. taking on Hampton. It's going to be the quarterback who can run and throw against Montrell Coley, who leads the league with over 800 yards and 16 touchdowns. Let me ask you this. What did Alvin Wyatt do to have a and and then Hampton's homecoming scheduled back-to-back -back in November. Hey, we've got another game with Hampton, and you saw that. a and at Hampton, so it should be interesting. That, of course, was Smith, the little man. Chad Smith on the reception. Hart was there to bring him down. However, he was able to gain some yards, so that will make it second and four from the 47. At least early on, Ronnie, I think that it's clear that the foot speed on the defensive side of the football by Florida A&M is well ahead. Good step, step and a half, maybe even two steps ahead of the offensive skill player, certainly at Norfolk, and they're going to have to do something to uh, get into better positions to make some things happen. Let me check that. That will make it a punting situation. Fourth down. Cornette back to punt. Isaac Brown back to receive. 
This time, the ball is going to be down yep. somewhere at around about the 19, but there's a flag on the play. That flag's going to come in on Neil Colsey. It was a block in the back or pushing the back of something after that ball had gone out of bounds, and that's just not using your head. Give Sam Jones an opportunity for some more airtime, but the bottom line is that was not a disciplined decision by Colsey that time. You know, this is a great building. I love this building here at Norfolk State. I was shot in the newspaper against this facility last week. I don't know what people were, were, were thinking of. One of the nicer 1AA on-campus facilities that you'll find. Well, that was just basically one man's opinion who hasn't been on campus. And when you don't take a look at the campus and look at the facility, then how can you write about it? Aren't we supposed to be objective in this business? Aren't reporters supposed to be balanced, fair, and accurate? Don't think that Bob Molinaro is. That commentary in view by Mark Gray, not necessarily those of the me act. <laughs> right. Okay. So now, but you know what? I'm with you, my brother. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be with you because of the simple fact that you did show me the article, and of course the one quote, and it made a lot of sense. This is one of the finer facilities in the me act. You're talking about a D one double A school. And let's face it, a lot of places would love to have. On the on the on the uh, FAMU. <laughs> I was, wondering, spare change? I was wondering who he was going to call it on. For a while, they, after, for a while they sounded like Andrew Galata yesterday, didn't he? When he couldn't get it together as to what happened in a fight against Mike Tyson. Oh, my goodness. But he got it together. But anyway, getting back to the stadium, this is a fine facility. A lot of Division I AA schools would love to play in a facility that can hold as many people as this and as nice as this. And let's be real for a second. You look at Norfolk State right now. I'm telling you, I think they're two years away from being a consistent force in this league. And that's the end. We're going to come back with much more action in a few minutes. Damn you in Norfolk State. Of its collegiate athletes as well as its collegiate graduates. I'm talking Leon Carter of Norfolk State alum. Yes. He was named the sports editor of the New York Daily News in September of 1999, and he is the first black sports editor of a daily newspaper in New York City. I tell you what, you know he's having a great time with the Mets and the Yankees getting ready for the World and Series, and he is a strong guy. Take a look at our Xerox stats in the first quarter. Mark Gray? 40, 41 yards total offense by Florida A&M to 29 by Norfolk State. The difference, two big turnovers, and the relentless pursuit of the front seven of the Rattler D. And look at time of possession there on our Xerox stats in the first quarter. Xerox bringing us the stats in the first, second, third, and fourth quarters. And time possession is huge. 11 minutes and 7 seconds for Norfolk State. Yet they lose this foot. They're losing in this football game. 14 to nothing. Second down, ball on the seven yard, ball on the 15 yard line, seven yards to go. See that interior of the Norfolk defensive front beginning to step up and play a little bit more uh, moxie right there that time. They've got to make their presence felt. They have to let people know that they do exist. This is the same defense that went into halftime against North Carolina State 0-0 and walked away losing 16-0. And North Carolina A&T, let's face it, they are one of the top teams, if not the best team in the MEAC this season. 36 was Matt Armstrong, one of the more aggressive linebackers on this unit. Jacque Nunley with the reception still on his feet. Nunley brought down first down. Nunley brought down at the 30-yard line. That's the first reception for a young man that still has his eyes on the prize, and that's the elusive record of Jerry Rice of 301 total receptions as a collegiate receiver. Boy, this is a sweet move after the catch. Watch. Breaks one tackle right there, two guys on him, and I'll spin right out of it. That is French pastry stuff right there, young fella. Woo, that's sweet. And Gray showing you that sometimes the feet can get moving on the run. Boy, he's not scared, not bashful at all. Every time I see Quinn Gray, I harken back to uh, game one of the season where three Delaware State Hornets converged on him and rocked his world. And let's take a look at the target schedule of today's MEAC action. You know, you look at that South Carolina State-Hampton game, you figure Hampton should go down there and blow out the Bulldogs. It's homecoming. 
Watch that one. Keep an eye on that one, Ronnie. We will definitely do so. Oregon State taking on Delaware State. The Bears have yet to win a conference game. This could be one that they could possibly pull off. But then again, you never know which Delaware State team shows up offensively. This is a team that likes to run the football to the Hornets. Let's set the over-under in terms of yardage for Graylin King at 200 today. Bears worst in rush defense in the conference. Second and seven ball on the 49-yard line. Quinn Gray is your quarterback. Gray back to pass. Gray has oh. a receiver. It's Jacquay <laughs> Nunley across the 40, the 30, the 20. Jacquay Nunley, M-E-A, see you later. Jacquay Nunley on a 51-yard touchdown, and it was all Jacquay Nunley from Quinn Gray. First you see me, then you don't. You think you have me, I know you won't. Boy, he shook him like collard greens shake me after Sunday dinner, baby. Watch this. Oh, my goodness. A freak move back to the inside, down the near side. Line. Great blocking by Junius downfield, and Jockway Nunnally takes it to the house. He's the number one stunner. <laughs> no, he's Big Paula, baby. <laughs> Big Paula, Jockway Nunnally taking it to the house. Point after is up and good by Vasquez. That will make it 21 to nothing. We're coming back. The whooping just keeps on coming. It's all fam you. Listen to the can. 20 catches away from Jerry Rice, and the reason why, a 51-yard touchdown this young man is putting on, and you see it right there, 283 receptions thus far. He's got a few today. Mark Gray, he's become a hero all the time. That was Nesbitt on the punt. Bringing it back with Smith. He brings it across the 30-yard line, stopped at the 32. You know, Neil Colsey gets in there on the stop once again, but he delivers a cheap shot. He slugged Chad Smith right after that play. There's no reason for that. Your team's up by 21 points. You're in full control again. Watch this. This is a cheap shot coming up right here after the game. He turns him over, a little shot there, and then bang, right in the face. He's lucky he didn't get flagged and get tossed. And when they look at that on the film, Colsey is going to get checked by his coaches. All right, that was Leonard Nesbitt on the kick. I checked that for you. It is first and 10 from the 32-yard line, a 21-yard return. And Smith gets no gain. Absolutely nothing. They have shored up the center of that field, and that middle window that George was talking about is being closed and shut tightly thanks to number 52 right there, Nikita Bynum. And he has Mo Forte right now just looking for answers. Now, this is a spirited defensive effort by Florida A&M. They're taking away the cutback lanes. They're doing a great job in pursuit in terms of stringing plays out. Outstanding defensive performance to this point by the orange and white. My grandmother, the late Mary Jane McQuaid, used to always tell me, you can forgive, but you don't forget. Mm. And you don't forget hits like that, Grandma. That was Cola. Let's go downstairs to George Johnson. Well, gentlemen, you know what? I talked to some of the guys over here at Norfolk State, and believe me, they do know what Florida A&M is capable of. You've talked about it already. Last year, they lost 56-7. to But the one that they remember the most was the last game played here at Norfolk State, in which they lost 84-14. to So that makes, in two years, they've lost by a combined score of 140-21. to The reason why the Spartans were so upset about that game two years ago was that because it was in front of their fans, they felt violated. They felt as if Florida A&M had come in and stolen something from them. Also, all, kind of disrespected them like disrespecting their children. And that's how they took it all week long as they prepared for this football game. They did not want it to happen in front of their fans again. But from the looks of things, Florida A&M on their way to another big win. Back up to you guys. All right, thanks a lot, George. Nikita Bynum on the stop just before that. Cola with a four-yard tackle for loss and I tell you what another punting situation for Mr. Cornette he's getting plenty of action for the folks in Columbus Ohio to get a chance to see him Isaac Brown at the 35 yard line that's where he starts things off from Brown still on his feet across the 40 Brown brought down at the 42 boy that's a great play that time one-on-one -on -one coverage and we'll come back and talk in greater detail about everything that's going on it's all flying you in Norfolk Nothing, fam, you with the lead. <laughs> 
Oh, 46-yard punt, 8-yard return there by Isaac Brown. The reason we're laughing, we know it's fam you, not <laughs> flam you, whatever you say. I am so sorry. <laughs> Shovel pass to March Banks. Crosses the 50 at the 51-yard line. Florida a &M right now beginning to have their way offensively and defensively up front with Norfolk State. And to use George's analogy, if they're upset about somebody coming into their house and stealing something a couple of years ago, maybe the next time they should just give it away. Or move or build a new house. <laughs> move to the new neighborhood. Second and two. March Banks for the first down. And we might have had a little fumble there. Seemed to be a bit of a rug rugby scrum developing at that time. Interesting, you were talking about uh, Leon Carter from the uh, New York Daily News. Uh, Norfolk State has been producing a lot of quality journalists over the last 20 years. A number of outstanding NBA writers graced this campus for many, many years. Ball on the 41-yard line, first and 10. High snap. Gray back to pass. He finds Jaque Nunley. Nunley still on his feet for a first down. He did it by himself. Boy, wow. they talk about Jaque Nunley as being a receiver who can rack up the yards as in run after the catch, and he is putting on a textbook exhibition of that this afternoon, taking short quarterback-friendly passes and turning them into big plays. That is what has made him special for the three years leading up to this season, and that could make him an awesome NFL prospect in the near future. Ten yards on the reception. Ball is on the 31-yard line. In and out of the hands of T.J. Hines. Well, that's the heir apparent, and here is the rackability of Jaquay Nunley. Taking the short pass, breaking one tackle, spinning, and taking a shot to keep the chains moving on that particular play. He'll come back, take another short pass, give up the really sweet move, go down the field, pick up a block. Junius does a great job, and that's what racking up the yards is all about. Moving the chains and taking it to the house. March Banks down the middle at the 20, 15. First down, O.J. Marks Banks the pass from Quinn Gray. I'm just wondering right now, are there any uh, windows in that Norfolk State offense? You know, maybe they should close the shutters or something because right now, Billy Joe is doing a great job mixing up the play. Short outside pass route on the previous play intended for Hines. Come back right, oh, right over the middle to a wide open March Banks, and they are knocking on the door once again on the Rattlers. As a reception of 16 yards, that puts the ball on the 15-yard line. First and 10. And that time, Bo <laughs> let it go. Thanks to Marcus Gray with an A. Watch this. You talk about coming up and not playing the ball, playing the receiver. Good afternoon, Mr. Bo. How are you? And I think DeMar's like, uh, <laughs> I'm feeling a lot like a lot of mine. <laughs> but I'm not going to quit. He has no reason to quit, but 21 to nothing lead. Second down. March Banks across the 10. March Banks at the two-yard line. O.J. March Banks, another first down. And you know what's happening? Quinn Gray's getting a lot of help from some fellas because when they catch the ball, they do some things with it. And he does a great job. Watch this right here. This is just wanting more than your opposition. Busting three tackles after Quinn Gray suckered the linebackers back in there to brought the pressure back to him. Just absolutely wanting it. Ball on the two-yard line. Gray tries to go in for the touchdown. And let's see. Is there a signal for a touchdown? He stopped at the one-yard line. And the big guys up front doing a nice job this afternoon. But again, you look at it, it's just a spirited effort. It's like an aggressive, confident Florida a and team. And about this point last week, they were checking themselves. James Agnew getting it done. Touchdown, FAMU, Quinn Gray, one-yard plunge into the end zone. Well, Florida a and seems to have all the answers right now. You know, whether it's with the run game on the draw plays, working it between the tackles, the short passing plays, and, of course, the deep stuff, Florida A&M is having their way. One guy who's helping out is Kevin Johnson. He's the new center in there, number 73. And Quinn Gray went right over top of him for that one-yard touchdown. So that makes it 27 to nothing, the Rattlers of FAMU. Vasquez with the point after attempt. 
Let's see. And it's good. 28 to nothing. The Rattlers lead. Nine plays, 57 yards to two minutes and 31 seconds. George Johnson, what do you got for us? Well, I'm standing by right now with the head coach of the men's basketball team, Will Jones, entering into his second year with this program. And you got one under the belt. How you feel? Well, I feel real good. Um, we had a very good recruitment here, brought in nine kids, brought in some great size, have an excellent schedule, play some real tough people that's ranked, you know, in the top five in the country, Maryland, LSU, Seton Hall. And, and the reason we play them is because we think, because they are young, that we get a chance, except for Maryland, who returned everybody. But it'd be a good experience because I think that they press a lot, and a couple of teams in our league press, and we want to try and see if we can handle that. And I think it'll be good learning for them. Your experience, I mean, we don't have to talk about that. Maryland University at the University of District Columbia, where you build a, a program. And even my producer in the ear is saying to make sure that you, you talk about the AU experience. But you bring a lot of experience here to Norfolk State. Talk about building this program, which it needed to be done. Well, you know, they just moved over into the Division One, And there's a lot of attitudes and things that we had to change to get to a one program. And I think that most of the youngsters know around the country or in this local area, that are very good, uh, we'll be good. You know, um, now you run into kids that you recruit, and the first thing the parents and them tell you is they want to go to the next level. I don't know how to call time out on the pro level. And, and in building, we have a very young team, and we have now depth in the positions that I like to have depth in. And I, I think that, you know, the kids played very well for me last year. We were in first place all the way up to the last, you know, week. And then we, you know, kind of folded because I guess we didn't have the depth. But um, I think that this group would be real good. We had a green and gold game last night. Both teams scored 90 points. You know, I like scoring, and uh, I think you have to score to win. And I, they did a very, very good job because we only been with them three, four days. So we just drilled. They didn't have anything in. So that's very positive on our side. One of the best views from a conference is up top. And you just mentioned that you were up top throughout most of the season last year. As you look down at some of the rest of these players real quickly, the rest of the teams, who's going to give you some concerns? Well, you know, the same ones, Coppin, South Carolina State, and all of them were picked, you know. And we were picked six in the league. Now, I didn't understand that because the only team in the league that beat me was uh, uh, Bethune Cookman. We whipped everybody else. So I don't feel, you know, shy or bad. Everybody now is a superstar. So we just had to go to war, but we're going to war with some different tools. So I think that we're on our way, you know, to being a respectable basketball team and take over from some of those people up top. Okay, well, I appreciate your time. Will Jones, head coach of the basketball team at Norfolk State. Let's send it back up to the guys where I guess they've been playing football throughout this whole thing, right? Yes, they have. And Nikita Bottom has come up with an interception, 28 to nothing. So once again, the Spartans' defense is out on the field against that Rattlers' offense that's been whooping some stuff and pulling it out. But to this point, we've only seen the whooping in jail form. We have, they have not opened the can yet of aerosol spray. Quinn Gray brought down the Boris Garns right there to help things out. Number 91. The big fella can get it done. He's got to be a little tired, though, because it seems like it's been repetitious. We just keep going and watching their offense score, meaning the Rattlers. Okay, that'll make it second and eight. Ball on the 20-yard line. O.J. March Banks is in the backfield. The quarterback, Quinn Gray, four wide receivers. The give to March Banks. He burrows his way for a first down, and he rolls them over, Carnes included. Boy, you talk about going through the middle and just taking some pounding. March Banks going into his best Montreal Coley impersonation. Right up the gut, breaking three tackles. You know, a couple guys stepped up in there and put their heads down and didn't, didn't lock up, and he's able to pick up a first down. 12-yard run, ball on the 8-yard line. And this time, March Banks goes, and guess who met him? McAfee. Vaughn McAfee. 57. Where you going, big fella? Nowhere when you're coming to my zone. And that's what I love about linebackers, that intimidation factor. I mean, you want to make sure that when a guy comes to your zone, when a guy comes creeping to your hole, you send him home in tears. And the next time he comes through, you want to have him looking for you out the corner of your eye, hearing those pitter-patter of big, nasty feet. And at that time, a bit overzealous that time, was... McAfee, who was set to come on a blitz right up the middle, and I think he made contact. You know, the thing about Von McAfee is that that was Outside. a tackle for a loss of five yards. Hits. That's huge. Five yard penalty. Still second down. 
when you look at his numbers overall, you can totally be impressed his surge. And one thing Mo Forte has to be impressed with is those numbers are huge. 41 tackles on the season. You know, and he's got like 10 or 12 that are behind the line of scrimmage. So he's active, he's aggressive. Like the great legendary Florida a and coach used to talk about, Jay Cable. Touchdown, Rattlers. <laughs> Touchdown for the Rattlers. Yes, they do. They give it. The Rattlers continue to pour it on. Once again, Quinn Gray has got to be the happiest guy on campus right now because he's finally getting it done. Well, it helps when your defensive unit is giving you quality operating position. I mean, three of the Florida A&M scores have come after turnovers. And I mean, when you're shrinking the field against a very explosive offense, it is a recipe for a 35-point deficit at least at the half. Once again, Vasquez. And the point after is good. 35 to nothing. Do you remember 84-14? We'll come back with much more after this. When people play a frustrated man, 35 to nothing, fam you with the lead. Isaac Brown on a six-yard touchdown reception from Quinn Early. Set to kick off. The man has been up and down all day because his team has been scoring a bunch of points. Lennon Nesbitt. Ben Anderson. Anderson got crunched. Did you feel it? Did you see it? Did you hear the explosion? Greg Ray, number 48. Woo! How you like me now? Mr. Anderson, you're a nice fella. I've been dying to meet you. How's it going today? My name is Greg Ray. Whoa, man! <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Rocked him so hard his parents probably felt it. Greg with the sting, Ray. Oh, my. Look at oh. You know, back in 1998, the score was 49-7 to at halftime of that game in which fam you won it 84 to 14. think about that you know this has been a sight for sore eyes for quinn gray oh, and the yes reason why here's a guy who has not been able to get off two weeks in a row but he remembered what he did last year against this same norfolk state team he passed 24 of 39 for 381 yards and four touchdowns he had touchdown passes last year of 64 68 25 and 12 yards not bad and don't be shocked if he has a couple of more before the end of this afternoon, the way things are going. He's already got a 51-yarder. Aaron Culpepper, you're not going anywhere. Jerron Daly said, where my dog's at? Somebody let the dogs out, and I think it was Mr. Daly. Boy, Daly, uh, and, and he also got some help that time from a whole crew of his partners. Abby Parsons was in there, Anthony Kohler was in there, and there's Daly. 42 tackles this season and only one sack, but there are a lot of times he's getting double and triple teamed because when you're a preseason All-American, by everybody's standards, all the forecasters and prognosticators say number one right there is a legitimate NFL All-American prospect, and you're able to still have 42 tackles at this point in the season. You're looking like an NFL linebacker to me, son. Third down, ball on the nine-yard line. Roberts has time. Roberts looking for the big tight end. Wayne Green, it was incomplete. George Johnson? You guys talked about Bailey there at the defensive end. I talked to him a couple of weeks ago, and he told me, you know, the most important thing for him to do, especially at trying to move up to that next level, is show the pro scouts that he is a linebacker and not a defensive end. Now, they'll line him up at the defensive end spot, but throughout the ball game, keep your eye on it because he may even find himself playing a little coverage, playing a little middle linebacker, playing a little outside linebacker. Bailey has the ability to play at the next level, but it may not be at the position that they name him defensive end it will be as you said mark at linebacker back up to you guys and and if you ask me from an nfl standpoint when scouts are looking for a player who's a tweener or who may be playing another position they look for upside the upside with him is his quickness his coverage ability he drops real well he also comes up and runs support he's aggressive and certainly has been a thorn in the norfolk state side all afternoon i mean he and cola and bynum are just 
Warriors and just dictating the entire tempo of the game. That's a 43-yard punt return. Four minutes and four seconds left to go just before halftime. Quinn Gray back to pass, pumps up in the air, and he has no place to go. Reason why? Big fella looking you straight in your face and saying, son, sometimes you don't win every battle. That was George Hudson. Houston, excuse me, on the tackle, number 64, George Houston. Well, that time he wanted to try to hit DeMar Bow on the far side, and he wasn't open. And when he re tried to reload to get it back out to him, that's when the sack took place. Loss of two, second and 12. Ball on the 36-yard line. Gray once again in the shotgun. Got a good snap, rolling out. Pass incomplete. And that time, Gray with the two-hop grounder. We, saw, we consistently see him struggle with those short out patterns, Ronnie. That's something a quarterback has to be able to deliver consistently. That's one of those unforced errors that we were talking about last week. You know, that's just an error that a quarterback can't afford to make. No, certainly against, uh, against quality competition. Third and 12 ball on the 36-yard line. Gray Fair was there on the blitz. The pass to Marchbanks. Marchbanks turned the corner, first down at the 49. A designed play which allows Fair to basically come, you know, uninhibited to the quarterback. And Gray showing the confidence, staying behind the line. See, watch him. He's just going to stay there. He knows 13 is bearing down on him, but he stays there and delivers a shot to Marchbanks, who picks up a couple of blocks. McAfee was sealed off that time, and Marchbanks goes down the far sidelines for 15 yards and picks up the first down. All right, first and 10, ball on the 49-yard line. Jelani Fair, number 13, was coming out wide. He thought he had his eye on the quarterback. He thought he had the heat, but Quinn Gray was able to let it go. This time, he hands off to Marchbanks. He cuts the corner. That's a fumble on the play, and the ball belongs to Norfolk State. Well, this defense, who's been struggling this afternoon, hasn't quit. And you just admire their toughness, their ability to continue to come back. And Jamal Naji makes a huge play this time to strip the ball and then recover the fumble. Check that. That was McAfee in there on the strip, Naji in there on the fumble recovery. Wow. How about that? Turnovers, you see at Norfolk State, three. Bam, you too. The difference, though, is those three Norfolk State turnovers have turned into 21 Florida AM points. No points off turnovers for the Spartans yet. That time, Roberts had sellers, but he was too long on the pass. Well, you know what happens when you're normally getting back into your three-step drop, and you're normally used to seeing number one and number 47 in your face, and there's nobody back there. You're a little bit quick with that release. Hold it a little more, a little bit more touch, and he's able to split the defenders because he had a step on Troy Hart, and it would have been Sellers and Hart in a race to the finish line. Three minutes left in the quarter, 35 to nothing. Fam U has the lead. We've talked about the domination Fam U has had in this series, winning three nothing. And of course, everyone remembers the last time Fam U came here, winning 84 to 14. This time the big fella comes through, the big tight end. You saw him there, Dwayne Green, number 92, first down, Norfolk State. Green takes that one to the 40-yard line. Well, you may be struggling with your arm, John Roberts, but you'll have the confidence of your teammates when they show you having the pocket presence and the confidence to stay in there with the defense bearing down on him. Daly had a beat on him, but he's able to connect with the tight end to pick up 14 yards. All right, that'll make it first and 10 from the 40-yard line. Roberts has a lot of ability. He needs the time to release the ball. This time he finds the time. He goes down looking for Sellers, and there was no Sellers. But there was plenty of fam you sitting there 
Donnell Vickers was trying to catch up for the interception. That was looked like it was one of those sight read kind of adjustments on the fly where the read Sellers made was to the outside, and under duress, the read that Roberts made was to the inside, and that's why that pass was almost picked up. That's a sight adjustment. Your receiver and your quarterback have to be on the same page of the book. If the receiver reads inside and you break outside, that, that's often a pass into double coverage and can lead to a turnover. Second down, 10. Ball still on the 40-yard line. Roberts goes deep again to Sellers. However, Troy Hart was with them, step for step. And he's just trying to lead the receiver and get him an opportunity to run, to go after the ball. But he's forgetting that Burnett is running a crossing route a little shorter, and he's in a better position to haul in the play. You know what? That thought crossed my mind as to why we have not heard the name right. Charles Burnett throughout this game. He, by far, is the most talented receiver here at Norfolk State, and yet... Roberts has not been able to find them. But we got a penalty, and Roberts was roughed by an aggressive Florida A&M defense, and that'll cost him 15 yards. Personal foul, roughing the passer on the defense. 15-yard penalty, first down. Look at your lower left-hand side of the screen and watch him getting nailed here at the end. A good two, three steps after that pass is released, and you got to hold up. These are mental mistakes that a team like Florida A&M, who's been through big games, should not be making up by 35 points. Two years ago, it was 49-7 to seven at halftime. Smith for a gain of two on the play. I understand that when you've got a team down, you're supposed to hit them in the head with a sledgehammer to try and kill them, but... You know, you're up by 35. You simply just cannot afford those ill-timed mistakes. You've seen Colsey with a couple of uh, personal fouls, little fisticuffs. You've seen uh, a couple of personal fouls, the late hits. You know, discipline plays, that, and Florida A&M is a better team than that. Second and eight from the 24-yard line, 35 to nothing. The fam, you Rattlers with the lead. Roberts drops back. Roberts flushed out of the pocket. Roberts still on the run. Now, Roberts intercepted in the end zone. And once again, Roberts is making huge mistake after huge mistake. And you just can't do that against the Rattlers. There in the interception was Joe. Well, Sequan Doe gets a gift interception because of a bad decision by John Roberts. That's right. Bang yourself in the head a couple of times, young fella, because you got outside the pocket. You had enough room in front of you to pick up the first down. See, if he tucks it under and run, he can pick up about 10 yards. But he wants to make a big play, so he forces it into triple coverage. You've got three white shirts, one green shirt. So what does that mean? One of those white shirts is going to pick it off. He was trying to get the ball to Burnett, but not under triple coverage, Ronnie. 129 remaining just before halftime. We've got our NUE band show coming your way. Featuring the hot ice. Ball is on the 20-yard line. First and 10. Quinn Gray finding time. Quinn Gray stepping it up. Going for Isaac Brown. Pass incomplete. And he had him on the square ring. He had his area wide open in the teeth of the zone. And a bad pass by Quinn Gray. Another one of those unforced errors that don't look as big as they did last week because A&T had jumped out early. But he had his receiver open in the center of the field on the crossing route. Just got to put it in the bread basket. The vertical game. The horizontal game. They want to get it done for Quinn Gray. His confidence has to be back. He's leading 35 to nothing. Let's see. He's got the one long touchdown pass to Jockway Nunley. 51 yards in this game. You wait till you see it at halftime if you missed it during the regular action. To Marchbanks. Across the 20. Marchbanks to the 25-yard line. That's a neat-looking play because what you do is you allow your receivers to clear the whole center of the field out and you release March Banks into the flat and just let him do what he does. He's got good hands, good feet, always moving, and some power. Less than a minute to go just before halftime. Don't be shocked if we see him take a shot at Nunley. Nunley's so dangerous coming out of that slot. He's the second. That's Nunley in motion. Fam, you fairly solid on third down conversions this season. That time, Quinn Gray looking for a receiver. 
incomplete. Travian Turner. Boy, and that was another pass that I'm sure he wishes he had back because his receiver looked like he was set up right there. Good job and coverage by Kyron Copeland. The sophomore was in position and forced to play. All right, they're going to be punting one more time. T.K. Smith, punter for FAMU, set to receive Chad Smith for the Spartans. Smith at around the 39-yard line. Smith at the 35. Smith still on his feet. Smith with the return to the 44-yard line. Norfolk Showplace, MacArthur Center Mall in the newly renovated Sheridan Nor Norfolk Waterside Hotel have teamed up for a great holiday shopping package from November 17th to December 30th for rates beginning as low as $92 per night. You'll receive a limited edition of the MacArthur Center Canvas tote bag of special shopping values and coupons at the many 130 unique stores. After you've shopped all day, you can drop for the night in one of Sheraton's most heavenly beds. I've been there. I've slept there. It's great. And you'll receive a delicious breakfast for two the next morning. Shop all day, rest all night at the Sheridan. Call 1-800-325-3535 or 757-622-6664. You don't want to miss it. I'm talking about the MacArthur Center Mall and the newly renovated Sheridan Norfolk Waterside Hotel. We've stayed there, Mark. Great place, and you know what? I love the pillows. like the pillows, and I like the view. And that's going to pretty much do it for the end of the first half, a first half that has been dominated by Florida A&M. And it really comes down to the inefficiency of John Roberts, the quarterback. Three big turnovers. Florida A&M turns it into 21 points. And the defensive front, the front seven of Florida A&M, who were manhandled last week in Tallahassee by North Carolina A&T, have stepped up in a major way this afternoon. And you talk about going in to the drawing board. Boy, Mo Forte has a whole lot. He's got to be Michelangelo to pull this one out. You know, so far they've held the offense of Norfolk State to no points. A year ago, FAMU's defense held the Spartans to a mere 121 yards of total offense on the day. 35 to nothing is the score right now. Is the confidence back for Quinn Gray? Let's put that question to George Johnson, who's down on the sidelines. George? Coach Jimmy Joe with me right now. Coach, first half you look at it, the offense seems to be clicking, and that hasn't happened the past couple of weeks. <laughs> no, it hasn't, but um, the offense is doing pretty well now, and it's really a, a kickback from what the defense is doing. Defense is stopping them, defense is hitting. The special team is coming up with some big plays, and um, it's just really helping the offense get started here today. When you have this kind of lead, how do you get the young men in the third quarter to come out with the same kind of intensity that they had when they started the game? Well, we've, we've, we've gotten shut, shut out the last couple of games, so there's still a lot of intensity in these guys, and they really want to do well. And they're going to fight, and they're going to keep fighting to the very end. Well, listen, good luck to you second half. All right. All right, Jimmy Joe, here. assistant coach here with Florida a and back up to the guys in the booth. All right, thanks a lot, George. Once again, our score is 35 to nothing. The Rattlers of Florida A&M University with the big lead. A year ago, they left 49 to 7. Now it's 35 to nothing. Will the Spartans ever score?
was the nephew of a retired associate professor of music. He was the first director of the MSG Jazz Ensemble and put together a saxophone quartet which became a touring group. More importantly, he's been recognized for his contributions to the general band program. He served as an assistant director in 1968, organized the Spartan Guard and the Dancing Girls, and Papa Silk, as he is uh, affectionately called, supervised the Silk Hats in the 70s. When the alumni band was first organized, he served as the university's liaison person. He also served as chairman of the NSU Homecoming Parade. He currently is serving as the chairman. Finally, he organized his own big band group known as Hester's Melody Makers. He was very helpful and thoughtful during the Spartan Legion leadership transition period. And now, Pop Silk is at the center of attention. He's at the 50-yard line. future MEAC star that is moving up the ranks of the NFL from the locker room to the front office. Whenever you're in the Cleveland Browns locker room, chances are you're going to see this guy. And chances are the players are all talking to him. He's Jameer Howerton. He doesn't play football, but he's a product of the MEAC a graduate from Maryland Eastern Shore. You know, I'm proud. I'm proud of myself. I'm happy, and I'm thankful that the Cleveland Browns have gave me a wonderful opportunity. An opportunity that Jameer took full advantage of. You see, this kid started his NFL career in the equipment room, but now he's a liaison in public relations for the Cleveland Browns, and he's more than willing to share that leadership role with others. It's a small fraternity of us. There's not too many, and you have to keep that line of communication going. Hey, work hard and stay focused. And um, I started out, you know, washing towels and, and, and taking care of the guys in the locker room. And I'm just happy. I'm thankful. So you got to keep that in mind. Now, even though Maryland Eastern Shore didn't have a football team, during Jameer days at Maryland Eastern Shore, he knows its rich history. However, he had an alternative plan when it came to his football itch. To be quite honest with you, at that time, it was like football, whatever, you know. <laughs> I used to go to Hampton, listen to the band and stuff like that, and come to, you know, walk and see you guys play. That was cool, but the basketball team was good enough for me, you know. It was, that was fine. <laughs> Eastern Shore was a blast. I mean, it's like I said, small institution. I mean, it was fun. It was, I had a lot, a lot of fun. Like I said, I was Mr. Party Party Man, but I got my work done. I got my work done. I did my thing. And today he's doing his thing with the Browns in media relations as a liaison between the players. He likes the players. He knows his job, and they like him too. Because he understands exactly where guys are coming from, you know, because frankly, we're in a league that's 85% African American. And, you know, you have to have people that can relate. You have to have people that you feel you can talk to there. You know, last year, you know, same name as me, Jameer, started out in the, in the uh, equipment room and then moved his way up. And that's a testament to him. 
See, not just everyone could look at him and just uh, and inspire, should inspire them because, I mean, everyone. I mean, it's just like me coming in. You come in and you're at the bottom. If you're not playing, then you want to get on the football field. That's him. You know, he don't want to be at the bottom. He don't want to be on the bench. He want to move on up. So I think it inspires everybody around here. And he's inspiring a lot of folks in the MEAC and especially down at Maryland Eastern Shore. I'm humble about it. You know, it's, it's, I'm thankful. You know, I'm thankful. And I keep trying to just work hard to represent where I come from. Another great star from the MEAC, and we're proud of Jameer Howard. And we'll come back with highlights and stats in a few moments. Fam, you leading 35 nothing. What's the answer for the Spartans of Norfolk State? FAMU's got all the answers. Maybe it's in a can and they're deciding to pour it out. 159 <laughs> yards in total passing, 27 for Norfolk State. Time of possession. Norfolk's had the ball an awful long time. They just haven't been able to get to the end zone at all. 21 points off of turnovers for Florida A&M. That's a big story. FAMU, when they do have the ball, they're able to move the ball effectively at will, out gaining Norfolk by almost 150 yards in just one half. And we can thank Xerox for giving us those Xerox halftime stats. You see it there. That's the reason why FAMU is leading 35 to nothing over Norfolk State. The Xerox stats never lie. Never, never. No one never. So you, you were talking about now, we, we saw the whipping in gel form in the first quarter. I heard the can opener rolling around in the second quarter. I mean, what, what comes after this, like a keg? <laughs> I would hope Florida him left the keg at home. You know what? Sometimes when FAMU is scoring and they really take it up, FAMU should not be in the MEAC. They should be in the <laughs> NBA because right. they put some high numbers on the scoreboard. Well, you know something? They outscore a lot of teams in the Eastern Conference of the NBA. They put up 84. Did, did the Knicks average 84 points a game last year? We'll see what happens. Isaac Brown set the return. He picked it up at the 11-yard line. Still on the return. Isaac Brown turns the corner, and he's pulled down at the 25-yard line. Well, if you're Florida A&M, you don't want to let up right now. And I think that, you know, people often talk about Billy Joe running up the score. I think this is a situation where he'll score as much as he wants because this is a game where they can improve their status as far as the national ranking is concerned. All right, our U.S. Airways quarterback comparison, and yes, they're flying high. Quinn Gray could be a pilot on a U.S. Airways flight. Look at him, 11 of 20, 159 yards, and of course that 53-yard touchdown to Jockway Nunley, I think that was a first-class pass into the end zone. <laughs> U.S. Airways quarterback comparison here on Almea College Football Saturday. March Banks in the backfield, Quinn Gray under center. The center, Kevin Johnson, doing a fantastic job. <laughs> And the pass is complete. Junius. Boy, after that call, Randy, I feel like I should be uh, making sure my seat belts are fastened and my tray tables are in their right, upright and locked position. <laughs> Always flying U.S. Air, though. U.S. Airways, the only way to fly. 14-25 left to go in the third quarter. We're just getting underway. Fam, you, the Rattlers, lead it 35 to nothing. Second down. Ball on the 27-yard line. Seven yards to go for first down. March Banks in the backfield, but Gray keeps it. Gray turns the corner. He was slowed up by Vaughn McAfee. Now let's take a look at our target scoreboard to find out what's been happening in the MEAC today. And look at that. As I stated, the Bears have a chance, but they're losing 7-6 to six to Delaware State. Everybody has a puncher's Hampton. chance. And South Carolina State just getting underway. No score. Watch the dogs, baby. Hey, and North Carolina A&T with an early 3 to nothing lead over Howard in the second. That's a letdown game. And uh... the pass to Isaac Brown. First down. Brown stopped at the 37. Our good friend Ed Hill, the outstanding sports information director at Howard University, wanted us to pass along a message. The folks at Norfolk State may be making the trek to Washington, D.C. next week for the homecoming game. It says get there early. <laughs> Expecting like 5,000 buses. And there's no parking at Howard. It's the worst parking in the conference. 35 nothing is the score in the third quarter. Woo! Shovel pass to O.J. Marchbanks. And that's a first down. I don't think our sound man who went to Howard appreciated my remark. <laughs> they killed my mic. <laughs> man. 
second and seven ball on the 42 yard line let me stop laughing and concentrate on this game in the shotgun formation quinn gray quarterback four wide receivers the normal set there for the family rattlers great play action great going long great looking for isaac brown incomplete well, he had Junius down near side for what it was worth. He was wide open and just didn't look at him. I guess he locked in on his receiver, Brown. And Brown, I guess it would be the speed merchant, kind of uh, assuming the role that uh, Kanan Lamb had for a couple of years down here. Not quite as explosive. And uh, solid job of coverage that time. Great job of defensive coverage. Uh, the secondary. Kyle Groves. And, and Kyle Groves was uh, running essentially stride for stride with Brown uh, in that situation. Ball on the 42, third down. Seven yards to go for a first down. T.J. Hines in motion. Shotgun formation. Familiar set for the Rattlers. And the pass is complete to who you know who, Jacque Nunley. Concentration that time was outstanding because what you just saw was great football in that one play. Divorce yourself from the score for a second. Quinn Gray does a great job of delivering the strike to Nunley, who maintains a great level of concentration with Marcus Gray bearing down on him, and he was almost able to pick up the first down. And, and, and O.J. Marchbanks doesn't get a lot of credit for blocking, but on that particular play, he literally saved his quarterback back Quinn Gray. T.J. Smith will do the punting duties for the Rattlers. He'll punt this one from the 34-yard line. Smith gets it. And the return is a yard at 20. We'll come back with much more. 35-0 FAMU. He's got the 28th, the 4th, and the 11th. A&T, Hampton, and back at Hampton. We're going to have a great time. Trifecta, huh? How much do those three games pay? <laughs> For another day and another time. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And Vickers, Donnell Vickers with the interception. Donnell Vickers with the touchdown. Bam, you back on the scoreboard again. Four turnovers, 28 points now, Florida A&M. Bad decision. It was a comedy of errors from the start. Poor execution up front, which led to a poor pass by the quarterback, and thus a beautiful touchdown by Florida A&M. And you got to wonder when Mo Forte is going to give Walter Amos an opportunity to come in and guide this offense of the Spartans, because right now, John Roberts has not done it well. Well, you know, you talk to folks who are really closely and, you know, uh, infinitely more familiar with the program than we, they will tell you that it's a white flag already up if they bring Amos in. So conventional wisdom suggests they're just going to leave the kid Roberts out there. And he's one of those games that maybe when you look back on him as a junior and a senior, he grows up from. Vasquez kick is up, and it's good. That makes it 42 to nothing. Fam, you. And there he is, Walter Amos, number 12, a young man who wants to get to the game. He's eager to play. Talk to him before the game. He says, I might be on TV. And you know what? He just might. He is on TV now. He wants to be on TV playing. Oh, so he wants to be on TV playing. He wants to be on TV in the end zone. He's a young man with a lot of talent. Now, if you've been sitting outside all on the sideline watching the starter get pummeled, and you can make your way on the TV by standing on the sidelines, I think it's a better day. But you get good face time. Exactly. See, look at him. No dirt on there, no cuts or anything, no shiners. No, he don't need to do that. If you want to get a shiner on, at least get, see, look, that's a, hey, that's a good face. Look at that hair right there. Hair not out of place. Well, I tell you, big Walter Ames. Boy, that kid looks like he should be in the middle of a line somewhere. I'll tell you what, bringing that's a him big down dude. can hurt you. That's a big quarterback, man. He's Leonard like a linebacker. Nesbitt is your kickoff man for the FAMU Rattlers, number 50. There he is. He's been kicking off a lot today. You know something, Mr. Nesbitt. Puns on and the set the receive back there. Excuse me, it's Chad Smith. Puns are the lowest form of humor. <laughs> Somebody behind me says he also plays quarterback like a linebacker. That ain't right. <laughs> that is wrong. Also back there with Chad Smith is Tyrone Sellers. Ball picked up, however, by Tyrone Hall. Wow. Tyrone Hall brings it to the 36-yard line. You got the Casey Kasem voice, Andy? 
because we've seen some of Miak's greatest hits this <laughs> afternoon. And Florida A&M has just been bringing the funk. You get the feeling that after eight quarters of frustration, they're certainly going about. about it's like watching the longest yard. Remember the scene where Eddie Albert tells the guys, all right, we're up by 42. Now the job is to inflict as much pain as possible on the opposition. Get the feeling FAMU is just pinning their ears back and doing something like that? We'll find out. The longest yard, the longest game continues. All I know is that they're in the sports groove. 42-0 is our score. FAMU will be back. Me and College Football Saturday. Florida A&M in complete control here, up by only six touchdowns at 42 nothing. And there you get a look at Ulysses Cox, who took a shot, and he just was twisted at the end of that play. Boy, well, there's nothing worse than being injured at, at, on a day like this. Damian Smith, first down. Smith to the 46-yard line. So at least a small consolation on that play. The primary area that Norfolk was definitely looking to attack from an offensive standpoint, and that's been one of the few times today that Damian Smith has been able to make more Forte happy by running the football. Damian Smith had 32 yards at halftime. Well, that probably was the toughest 32 yards of his career. That was a 10-yard run. Now he has 42 yards for the game. First and 10 from the 46. John Roberts back to pass. Roberts going up top, looking for Burnett, but it's intercepted once again. Fam, you there, Carlos Moore. And Moore still on his feet. Moore with the 50, the 40. Moore forced out of bounds around the 25-yard line. And we'll have a penalty foul lag back around the 29-yard line of Florida A&M. Probably a clip or something like that. They will say he stepped out of bounds at the 33. So it is coming back. But you know something? This is a situation, that last pass, where you can't fault it on the protection because the protection is there. Roberts is frustrating and consistently forcing. See, an illegal block in the back will be the infraction. It'll be a spot foul. That flag dropped all the way back at the 29-yard line. So Florida A&M won't have golden scoring opportunity once again. Illegal block in the back, above the waist, on the receiving team, doing the return. 10-yard penalty, first down. Sam Jones with the Hall of Fame call. Illegal block in the back, above the waist. See, protection is good in that situation for Roberts. Goes deep downfield into... What is that, quadruple or quintuple coverage? There are three, four Florida A&M uniforms around that ball when it goes up, and his receiver, Burnett, has absolutely no chance. So this is a situation today where, unlike what we saw a couple of weeks ago where John Roberts' supporting cast didn't help him out, he's done nothing to help them today. Once again, FAMU has the football. FAMU wants to get back to the end zone. Let me ask you your philosophy of when a team is winning and a coach continues to score. And there's that old adage of putting it on, staring it up, running up the score. And I have a difficulty with that. We'll talk about it in a few. Second and ten. Rattlers have a new quarterback now, Ronnie. It's Joe yeah. Jackson. Joe Jackson. The left-hander almost had it intercepted. That time, Joe was going for E.J. Collier. So now it was incomplete. You, you were talking, you were asking a question about, you know, what do you think about the coach? dogs on. Look, you have to do, first off, you have to do what you have to do. And the bottom line is only 16 teams make the tournament. You are at the beck and call of pollsters. Whatever you can do to enhance your postseason prospects, you have to do. You can't call off the dogs because the opposition isn't up to your level of play on that day. They got to step up. They're down. One time Jackson got brought down. And, and people will talk about, you know, if Florida A&M scores another couple of three touchdowns that Billy Joe was running the score up, he has called off the dogs effectively. Out is Quinn Gray. So Jaquay Nunley wasn't in on that last series. I don't think we saw O.J. March Banks as well. So if your second unit continues to operate at maximum efficiency against the opposition, opposition's first unit, then you're just a much better football team. See, I agree with you, and my philosophy goes even beyond that. The thing about it is that you're in this game to score Right. 
okay, if you don't score points deliberately, what's the difference in when you don't score points deliberately in your point right. shaving? Substitution <laughs> infraction. Think about it. On the point well you, taken. Think about it. No Five one has ever position. thought about it that Still way, but it's down. like, okay, I'm, I'm going to control this game because I don't want to put any more points on the board. That's point You shouldn't have to do that. If you're going to put points on the board, put points on the board. Right. It's not, you may never get this opportunity again to exercise these third, second string players. I don't care. These kids are here to do one thing. They want to score. They want to win. And that is, you know, and it yeah. does a lot for FAMU's confidence. Let's face it, FAMU has lost two games in a row. They are five and two overall. They are four and one right now in the conference. And all signs say FAMU has to win out in order to win the MEAC this year. Not only win to win the MEAC, they got to get back into the Sweet 16. They're for rated that number 19 right. right now in the country, and they've got to be in the Sweet 16 in order to make it in the playoffs. Chad Smith still rolling around for it. He picked it up, and Chad Smith was brought down. That that was not perhaps the best thing to do, as you can see right there, because Andre Brooks was there to hit him, along with Sizemore. We've got George Johnson on the sidelines. George? Well, you just saw Mr. Chad Smith get hit hard, get hit very hard on returning that kick. Yeah, I want to take you back to the first half where number three, Ben Anderson, who was returning a kickoff for Norfolk State, also got hit very hard. In fact, right now, he's still woozy. And the reports from the bench is that he is out for the game. He will not be back. Also, you saw number 40, Ulysses Cox go down, have to be taken off the field they're still examining the leg they want to say leg looks like it's more knee than anything but if we get a more updated report we'll send it back up to you guys as soon as we get it back to you now in the booth all right thanks a lot there was a fumble on the play but mr smith was able to be mr catch up to his own fumble boy he's talking about the kid still over there being a little woozy <laughs> he's just boy, he's a little bit more than woozy right there that kid is dazed and confused. Yeah, ben definitely. Anderson's out of Sacramento, California. I think he thinks he's back in Sacramento, California. And there's your guy that got a little twisted on you. You see him. Hey, and the big fella is in the game. Aaron Culpepper, we're down by Darnell Vickers in company. Well, as Polo was there. As Florida A&M has called off the dog, so to speak, offensively by bringing in more substitute players, the defensive crew is still their number one unit. The Bynums and the Parsons and the Colas and Jerron Daly's and Troy Hart's are still out there. And there's your big guy, Walt Amos. He's in the game. This kid, Roberts, has a 3.9 GPA. But, of course... This is not the best day to be going into class for the final exam if you're in his situation. Not at all. Might have algebra equations. Amos back to pass. Amos Good looking catch. for a receiver. And, yes, he found someone to greet him, Jeff Hankerson. Nice catch. Happy to see something finally work out for these, the, this team, these kids, but it's not, not enough, enough for the first, first down. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's what they needed, the first down to sustain that drive. A safe route. Just give the quarterback an opportunity to pick up some confidence, and he finds Hankerson. That is a name that we haven't called. I kind of expected him to be a big factor in the offense. Jeff Hankerson, Charles Burnett, those were names. Chad Smith. Tyrone Sellers. Absolutely. Cornette with the punt. Isaac Brown at the 15. We're down at the 17. Boy, I like Isaac Brown. He is a tough, hard-nosed, gutsy punt return guy. Something to stick around and watch the rest of the game for. The FAMU Rattlers, the fastest man alive back in the day was Bullet Bob Hayes. An Olympic sprinter turned football star and one time dubbed the world's fastest man quickly changed the NFL defensive pass cover strategy because of that slot back at FAMU. He led the Dallas Cowboys in receiving three times in his career in total 7,295 yards and 71 touchdowns. A FAMU graduate, Bullet Bob Hayes. There's a guy that I wish more people had an opportunity to get to meet and to know. I had an opportunity to spend a couple days with him a few years back. What a tremendous guy. One of the real characters. Tells one of the greatest stories about how cold it was in the Ice Bowl and Super Bowl. He stands there and he sneezed. It actually froze on his face. Good job, Can you imagine what it's like being a kid from Florida going up to the Ice Bowl in that game? 
<laughs> All right, let's take a look at our target scoreboard to find out what's been happening with Miak. And as the day, you can see it. Hampton leading South Carolina State 14 to 7. That game is in the first quarter. Howard and North Carolina A&T 10-10. Tell me, Steve Wilson isn't getting the job done. No, a and is having difficulty getting back up after a difficult emotional win on the road last week. So I think a the Aggies will come around in the fourth quarter. Jackson brought down Chaz McDowell was there. 42-0 is our score. Action Joe Jackson brought down, and that's going to point them in a punting situation. And this may give the Spartans their best opportunity to get onto the scoreboard right now. I guess in this situation, you have to look for small victories to play for, and just breaking the goal line right now has to be the only thing left for Norfolk to play for today, Ronnie. I mean, for all intents and pur purposes, the uh, outcome was never in doubt here this afternoon, so now Norfolk has to look for positives that they can take out of this game and build on for the rest of the season because until this point, they have been a, a, a steadily improving team, but over the last couple of weeks, it has been nothing short of ugly here in their area. And there's Jerron Daly having another big game after a big game last week against North Carolina A&T. And the crowd at a MEAC football game is beautiful and colorful, and fans throughout this league stick by their team. Oh, they do. They're passionate about them. And, uh, you know, last week was a great experience going down to Tallahassee and a great audience that we had there. How about this Greyhound quick fact? Norfolk State founded in 1935. And the enrollment, 7,200. The nickname, the Spartans. The color, the green, and the gold. And they joined the MEAC three years ago in 1997. Give them a couple of years, Ronnie. For sure. The ball took a nice little Norfolk bounce at the 30. And they're going to spot it, I believe. At the 35. The thing I like about Norfolk State's program's potential. And you got to divorce yourself from what's going on here today. It's... Yeah, this is this is a, a classic, you know, Cola, and I believe that was one of the reserve running backs, Ramel Samuel, who got into a little something something with uh, Anthony Cola. But well, they're going to spot it at the 30-yard line. They try to knock it back to the 35, but they're going to spot it. The officials, rightfully so, at the 30-yard line. Some frustration, some pent-up frustration coming out. Walter Amos to give the Smith. Smith for two yards. But back to the point I was making about the future of this program, I think that this is such a fertile recruiting area. People do not understand the quality of athletes, Ronnie, that are from this area. You think of Bruce Smith. You think of Michael Vick. You think of Allen Iverson. I mean, Alonzo Mourning. Oh, oh, Alonzo Mourning. And our, our thoughts and prayers are definitely with Zoe these days as he faces that kidney battle. But this is Sweet Pea Whitaker is another one. I mean, you think about it, such great athletes in this area will take a lot of the pressure off of the recruiting budgets. And in so doing, Norfolk is going to be a quality program. In and out of the hands of Sellers. And unfortunately, he was out of bounds when he finally was able to tag it down. Tyrone Sellers, number six. That first time I think they went in his direction this afternoon, Ronnie. We were looking forward to uh, we were looking forward to seeing him a whole lot here. And you know something? We definitely have to give props to the Florida a and faithful, whose team, despite losing twice in a row, a significant contingent of Rattler faithful have made their way to Norfolk this afternoon. They always do. And that's the one thing I admire about the folks in Tallahassee. We had a great time. And, yes, we did. And I have to admit, they got the best tailgating food down there. Well, wait a minute. Man. I, st I, st I started <laughs> borrowing some tailgating food from people. I just never came back now, look, to give you any. Look, I know we're going to North Carolina That's what I'm week. saying. And you have Greensboro on this homecoming. I'm not. I'm just trying to tell them. I'm trying to get fed. Hey, hey, I'm trying to get their food right. That's what I'm trying I'm to I'm trying to get fed, bro. Now, you go around talking about what you had. That's all good. Don't, don't upset the Aggies. Yeah, the catfish was off the hook. Man, look, I know it was, but you're not supposed to tell folks on the way to Greensboro about that. You should, because then they, then they do better food, Mark. You don't understand. I already put the order in for the soul 
All right, Terry Cordette is punting again. Let's get back to the game. 42 nothing <laughs> is the score. <laughs> Norfolk State not able to get a first down. High snap, and Cornette is right down. You're not going anywhere, Terry. And the reason why, when there's a high snap like that, you guys have to recover soon. And Andre Books recovered all right. He was Johnny on the spot for FAMU. A mental thing. That's just mental mistakes. A bad snap, and Cornette had absolutely no chance to get the punt off, and he was the one glimmer of light on an otherwise look at lovely him. after He even has a little smile on his face. He was like, look, man, if it would have came to me right, I would have did okay. Now, you know 14 yard loss on that play, too. He's like, now nah, I can be part of the team. I've been hit as hard as some of you guys who've been running down here. <laughs> I'm one of the team now. I'm a football player, not just a punter anymore. Okay. <laughs> Jackson with the pass. Jackson goes to EJ Collier. You just got an idea of the type of talent and the speed that Florida A&M has. And just when you figure, well, what are they going to do next year? They look like they're about ready to retool and be just as quick and just as dangerous from a Gulf Coast offensive standpoint. You know, you got guys like Wayman White, DeMar Bow in the game. Wow, look at that rushing differential. Well, I think it might be about 65 now, <laughs> but it's still nothing for Norfolk. Let's go downstairs to our man George Johnson, who's got a feel for the flavor of what's going on downstairs. Actually, gentlemen, I wanted to throw this by. You know, throughout this whole week, the fans down at Tallahassee, and I don't mean take your minds away from Greensboro, because I know you're thinking about nothing but food up there. But just to take it to Tallahassee, you know those folks were not happy with their Rattlers after losing two straight. This week, Billy Joe came in with a T-shirt at practice that said, play hard or go home. It was the attitude all throughout the week for the Rattlers. It was the first time he had unveiled that shirt, and the attitude is still that they can make the playoffs. They have three goals here at Florida A&M, win the MEAC, then win the Black College Championship, and then, of course, the National Championship, which they fell one game away from last year. But again, the attitude this week, play hard or go home. Looks like they're playing hard before they head back home. Back up to you guys. And look at that significant contingent of Rattler faithful who made their way all the way from Florida and parts in between, because when you start talking Talking about alumni associations, that Florida A&M alumni association is simply large, and there they go. A much different uh, set of expressions than we saw last week. Man, they were quiet. <laughs> that was the quietest 25,000 people I've ever been around in my life. K. Smith with the punt. Almost That's down at the one. Troy Hart. After two picks <laughs> and a touchdown, still has the still, energy to do that. Still playing hard, not ready to go home. And you know, I'm just wondering if you're a Florida A&M fan and your team regroups, runs the table, gets into the playoff, because I think Florida A&M is a dangerous team in the playoff. That was a 43-yard punt there by TK. And here's our Greyhound quick fact. Mark, do and, be honest. And you think about it, a school founded in 1887, over 11,000 students. Of course, the colors are orange and green, and they joined the MEAC in 1979. This is a team that won a national championship, has a legacy of greatness. And, oh, yeah, by the way, two years ago, they were Time Magazine's National College of the Year. And despite all the player hating that goes on for many people down there, Flam Florida A&M, pardon me, continues to be dominant academically as well as athletically in this league. Smith for a gain of a yard at best for the Spartans. What are you doing for Christmas, Ronnie? For Christmas, I tell you what, I've got some possible plans. I might be coming back here to Norfolk, Virginia. The reason why I get the Dickens to the Sheridan's Norfolk Waterside and the Virginia Stage Company for their special holiday package for the Charles Dickens Classic, A Christmas Curl. Your holiday package includes two tickets to the play, the MacArthur Center canvas tote bag, valet parking at the hotel, shuttle transportation to and from the show, a deluxe room, breakfast the next morning. I'm not finished. 
What? Once they get to the price, the package for two begins at $109. Even you, Mark Gray, can afford it on the salary you make for MyTeam.com, <laughs> including taxes. <laughs> Additional person, only $20. So you can bring me. Show dates run December 1st to 23rd. Make this event a holiday tradition for your family. Call 1-800-325-3535 or 757-622-6664. So does that mean we get Carol for Christmas with that? Hey, if the check comes on time, you do. <laughs> and look at the re consistent, relentless defensive pursuit by Florida A&M. The guys up front, you know, this is the second team that's looking to crack into the first team, and they're just going at, going at it on just fifth gear from here on out. And that's what Mo Forte is lamenting right now. What can I do to at least keep the ball away from them long enough so that they don't score anymore? That's what it is. And at least this time, Cornette is able to get it off. That he is, Isaac Brown. He's going to pick it up at the 27. Brown turning. Brown is turned down, too. He oh. clears it at the 36. Did he take a shot? Man, I'm glad he's all right over there, but he took a shot. But he hit the ground extremely hard. That was a 10-yard return. And and this is... Now, what do you tell... If you're Mo Forte right now, what are you trying to tell your running back, Damian Smith? Son, go in there, run hard, and duck. <laughs> Don't get hurt. <laughs> I'm going to need you for the rest of the season. Minute 46. Remaining. That was a 61-yard punt. Not bad at all by Mr. Cornette. I guess he made up. Jackson. Get the ball. Get the ball. Fumble. And the fumble is picked up Let's go. by Tavorius Khan. Well, we talked about Norfolk State at this point in the game playing for nothing but looking for something positive, something to take from this ball game that can help them be better for the rest of the season. And a couple of spirited defensive stands over the last couple of series certainly have to be something to give some semblance of satisfaction or pride to the Norfolk State defensive contingent because, you know, it doesn't look like it. The defense has not played that bad in this game, right? Well, you talk about the points that have been given on the turnovers, and that's been huge. And let's face it, fam, you will capitalize on your mistakes. Walter Amos, still the quarterback. Josh back to pass. Finds the big tight end. Across the middle. Well, Ronnie, it's been a relentless and aggressive defensive effort by both teams. And let's take a look at some of these sacks. That's Roberts getting peppered early in the first quarter by Jerron Daly. That's Quinn Gray getting peppered that time by the interior of the Norfolk line. That's Joe Axon Jackson getting clocked. That's famous Amos of Norfolk State getting clocked. And then, of course, Jackson once again loses the fumble, and it's recovered by Norfolk State. That was uh, Tavares Carnes who uh, fell on that football. But the front sevens of these two teams have been active and aggressive all afternoon. First and ten from the 23. Aaron Culpepper turning the corner. Flag is thrown. Touchdown. But a flag was thrown on the play. We'll have either holding or a clip to the outside. I think it's going to be holding one of those receivers. It might have been number six sellers who tried to seal Vickers with that downfield block and to get Culpepper to the outside. I think this one is coming back. It's just been that kind of day for Norfolk State this afternoon. Holding is the call against Norfolk State, and that would not have been a touchdown. They would have downed it at the one-yard line. Watch him here. He'll go out of bounds I think that right was, at the one. I think that was Troy Hart. Hold it. Ten-yard penalty. Still first down. That was Troy Hart who was shoved down, I believe, that time by Sellers, the receiver. And they'll back it up once again. Wayne Green, number 92, is a big fella. Lining up the tight end position. Got soft hands, too. 6'4", 260 pounds. Wow. Sound like the guy we saw lead blocking for A&T last week. Oh, he's a big fella. Smith going off right tackle. Still running hard. Pick up a four yards on the play. That will make it second and six. 
Damian Smith, a talented young running back. I like his ability. I like the way he works his feet, man. His knees are real high. They're always active. He has great vision. I mean, give him a little bit of help up front. He could be 800, 900, maybe in a thousand yard back in this conference. All right, second and six from the 20 yard line. They're going to mark it at second and eight. Aaron Culpepper making people miss. Culpepper pushed out of bounds at the 19. That's about a one of the nicest two or three yard runs you'll ever see. I mean, because initially when he went to the inside, there was nothing there. So his vision, and he looks outside, see, watch. He wants to go through one hole, it's not there. Wants to go through a second hole, it's not there. Wants to go through a third hole, it's not there. And it has enough speed to get to the outside. A strong stiff arm on Moore, and he's able to pick up a couple yards as we go to the fourth quarter. So uh, small victories. Only one touchdown <laughs> given up by Norfolk State in the third quarter. 42 nothing is our score. We're coming back, 42 to nothing. Remains our score. We're headed down the final stretch. Fourth quarter of football, Norfolk State has yet to touch the end zone. And the only time they've seen it is FAMU getting in there right off the Well, when you talk about struggles to get into the end zone, the Norfolk State Spartan offense this season came into this game having scored only eight offensive touchdowns. And, and here's, here's a look at today's stats, and it's all Florida A&M. Not just today's stats, but the Xerox stats in the third quarter, and, and yes, it is. Fam you. First down. It's funny that coming Chris in. Smith. Sorry, Ronnie. Coming into this game, did you know? Norfolk State had only scored 11 total touchdowns this season. <laughs> Eight of them were by the offense. It's amazing. And you look at guys like Sellers and Burnett, who are chief contributors to the touchdown quota. Nada for this day. High formation for the Spartans. Cole Pepper turning the corner at the five yard line. Darnell Vickers steps up and puts a solid shot on Cole Pepper. Boy, I tell you, the little kid, watch number three come up and put a shot on Cole Pepper behind him to drive him in the turn. Boom, yeah. Boy, he stuck. Yeah, that's right, Aaron. You're in the right on the sideline to uh, have a cold one after that one. Woo! And we've got a timeout by Florida A&M. So Billy Joe definitely wants to try and protect the shutout. And you never know. He might just do it. They haven't scored yet. We'll come back. Me at College Football Saturday. Gardens of Norfolk State. One of their hometown favorites. Won an NBA championship with both the Washington Bullets and the Milwaukee Bucks. I speak of the great Bobby Dandridge, part of MEAC College Football basketball coverage here on MEAC College Football 2000. Second and five for a touchdown. Amos gives off the Smith. Touchdown, Norfolk State on the scoreboard. There he is, Damian Smith in the end zone. And you got to feel good for him, as well as their fans who stuck with it, stuck with him on this afternoon. They just kept fighting and fighting and fighting. And a good job that time by Smith to get the ball into the end zone. Cornette will apply the point after. The kick is up and good. It's 42 to 7. We'll come back. Norfolk's on the scoreboard. Will there be more? We'll find out as we continue. First thing, as you can see in the middle, the flags are still flying at half staff. And we, on behalf of the Mideastern Athletic Conference and our crew, would like to express the condolences to the families of the fallen service people from the USS Cole, which is based here in Norfolk, Virginia. The memorial services were yesterday. It's been a really somber and humbling couple of days. And hearts and thoughts and prayers go out to the families of those servicemen. And you know, as one guy who never went to the service, you've got to always give special appreciation to the people who are covering your back most definitely you know even coming down here uh, putting sorrow in the heart when you consider what transpired earlier this week 
uh, with the memorial service here in Norfolk. And knowing that some of the young people whose lives were lost had great relationships with some of the people here on campus. 19, 21, 20 year old kids. Really sad. 42 7 is our score. First and 10. Jackson with the give to EJ Collier. Pick up a three. George Johnson. Well, one guy who is not on this field that you would expect to be on the field is the head coach of Florida AM, Billy Joe. He's not on the field because he does his coaching from the coaching booth. He's one of the few head coaches in all the country who coaches a football game from the booth. I asked him about it. He says he's been doing it since 1990, but he got the idea nine years earlier in 1981 when, as the head coach at Central State, his team was playing Eastern Illinois. He went over, introduced himself to their head coach, and their head coach says, I'm really glad that we're able to talk right now because you won't see me at the end of the game. I like to coach from the booth. Billy Joe thought it was kind of weird at first, but then remembered that his team was losing 53 to nothing at half to Eastern Illinois and said, hey, that must be a pretty good thing. He didn't do it right away. He was a little nervous, but eventually he got the nerves. He said, well, I didn't do it until we were playing a team that wasn't nearly as good as most of our opponents. But the reason he's in the booth, most notably, is in the fact that he really trusts his staff. That's the only way this works, is that he has a very mature and very experienced staff, led, of course, by his brother, Jimmy Joe. Back up to you guys. And Jimmy Joe was an outstanding performer at Morgan State University, and now he's an outstanding offensive coordinator. And I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, Jimmy Joe has one of the great offensive minds. He works really well in collaboration with his brother. I'm just wondering, could somebody lure him away from FAMU? You never know. Anton Floyd is the quarterback in now and in for FAMU, number 16. Floyd back to pass. Oh. And finds his receiver. <laughs> Yeah, I like uh, this Floyd is brought some excitement back into the contact the way he works it going outside hitting Travian Turner Guy gets back in there does a little dance step little pirouette move to get to the outside and then he delivers a strike Travian Turner on the reception So it's a fourth down and Florida A&M up by 35 is gonna go for it fourth and one <laughs> And they get it and they get it <laughs> I tell you, Billy Joe's going to make you play all 60 minutes. What do you say? Work, work hard, go home? They say the rich get richer. <laughs> they unload and reload and keep shooting you down. Matter of fact, if the MEAC was the equivalent of the NFL, you would say, fam, you would be the St. Louis Rams. <laughs> At least today. E.J. Collier trying to turn it on. Well, he, he, ran, he ran into Irvin Mack that time. He was the freshman that stepped up in place of starting strong safety Marcus Gray. And he just clocked him. Bunch of happy fellas on the sideline there. Yeah, the expressions are a lot different this week. There was frustration and consternation on that sideline last week. They came and they conquered once again. Fam, you will move to 4-0. Lifetime against Norfolk State. E.J. Collier again on the carry. So this is a good, good game for Florida A&M, who really face a tough road to hoe, if you will, in terms of compete, winning that MEAC championship. Now, it would appear that they've done, and as we look at the option here, this is a, it, which is really strange when you think about Florida A&M, you think about three-step drops and then vertical passes, and to, to see a pitch is just, just blows you, takes you back just a little bit. Antoine looking for a receiver. Found his man down there, Wayneman White. It's not enough for a first down. So they're going to have to punt the ball again, family. This kid gives you that mo mobility that uh, Juwan Sider gave him last year. A lot, lot, lot more flexibility within the pocket than we see with Quinn Gray. TJ Smith. Set to punt once again. Set to receive Chad Smith. And it a block punt. And this is something that Norfolk has been so good at this season. 
So they haven't quit, Ronnie. No, they haven't. And that's a sign of what a Mo Forte team is all about. Timmy. Well, the recovery of that block kick was John Battle, number 43. Let's watch it again in slow motion, Mark. Well, I believe coming in through that time, number 38, Coochie Collins in there on the block. And now Norfolk has another opportunity to do something positive. So maybe 14 is the is the magic number in terms of a point scored by Norfolk in their home games against Florida A&M. Me at College Football 2000 is produced by MyTeam.com Productions exclusively for the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference and its authorized outlets. Any use, or reuse, or retransmission of this broadcast without the written consent of the MEAC Commissioner's Office is prohibited. So now Norfolk is beginning to move the change just a little bit against this uh, basically second team unit, Florida A&M defensively. Wayne Green, you see him there, number 92. And on the sideline getting attention for Norfolk State, still Ulysses Cox. Hopefully he'll be able to play another day. People who never get enough credit are the trainers who work so diligently with the football teams all the time. Aaron Culpepper, but Aaron, you had big dreams, but they were shattered real fast. Quickly that time. So if you're Florida A&M, you, you're, you're thinking right now, it's a great start for the last quarter of our season in order for us to run the table, try to play ourselves into position to get to the tournament. And I got to tell you something. I think Florida A&M is still a dangerous team going into a 16-team Russian roulette type of crapshoot. Well, you know, we talked about the whole scoring thing, and, and let's face it, pollsters, people who, who make decisions, are impressed by big scores. So FAMU putting 42 points on the board is big. It makes an impression. But is, does it make as much of an impression as another defensive sack or like 60 points? Well, they've got some huge games. Let's face it, yep. the game against Bethune-Cookman is going to be huge. The game against Hampton is going to be huge. When you look at the MEAC right now, you've got four teams that are vying for the MEAC mm -hmm. championship. North Carolina A&T, Bethune-Cookman, FAMU, and Hampton. Oh. I mean, it's quite obvious. You but, know, that you look at these those four teams and you say, okay, now, who can we pick? Right now in the driving seat, you've got to give it to the Wyatt Bone Crew. Down in Daytona Beach because they're seven and zero overall. They're seven and zero overall. And I know what you're going to say about the teams that they've beaten and no. everyone hasn't been there. But I'm telling you right now, I'm looking forward to seeing Jay Rogers. I'm looking forward to seeing Patel Trotman. Wow, Culpepper was wide open and the pass was delivered right into the bread basket and it goes off of his hands. That's just a lack of concentration. But you know, you're talking about Alvin Wyatt's Bethune-Cookman team who I can and, and simply not wait to see next week. But remember, they're 4-0 in the conference, Mark. They are 4-0 in the conference. a and right now is 3-0 in the conference. Hampton is 3-0 in the conference. And but, fam, you 4-1. But something has got to give. I think it's great when you can have that type of parity, that type of strength at the top of your lineup. The other thing that's great about what's happening in the MEAC this year is when you look at the Black Sheridan poll, you've got Bethune Cooper number one, North Carolina A&T five and one, number two, then you've got Hampton number five, they're five and one, and of course, FAMU five and two, number seven. Amos got Sellers and he couldn't have hook up with him that time, but BCC's road is just extremely tough. I mean, they have to go to A&T for A&T's homecoming. They have to finish it uh, Florida A&M. They've got a, a game they should win at Howard, but you never know with the weather being a Daytona Beach team going up to the wind and cold of D.C. and that hard turf. And then, of course, you know, the Hampton-Bethune-Cookman game. So Bethune-Cookman goes to Greensboro for the Aggies homecoming and to Hampton for the Pirates homecoming consecutive weeks. I'm anxious to see how they come out of those games physically. I'm wondering, do they have enough to physically handle that burn? Because well, their last Hampton. month of season Think about is Hampton's hard work. I mean, they've got, they've got FAMU, and then they've got North Carolina a Mm-hmm. So I think a and in the driver's seat myself. So if a can escape Bethune-Cookman next week and not stub their toe, I think, I think a and uh, it's going to be a tough road at Hampton for the Aggies to win, but they're not intimidated. I think if you can go into Tallahassee and when you can go into Armstrong Field. But I don't, I, I, I just don't think Bethune-Cookman, I think they're, they're, their scheduling is just a killer. Stay up to date on the MEAC 
and all of his teams by going to MiacSports.com. Daily results of what's happening in the conference. Get the latest. All you have to do is go on the computer at www.MiacSports.com for your up-to-date news and information about the best conference in America, the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference. 42-7 is our score, 7.39 remaining in the game. We're in the fourth quarter. It's going to be third and five for the Spartans. I'm trying to sustain that game. I'm solid, but, the drive. but truly uh, putting the all-groove team together. Are you really? Yeah. Well, we'll have an announcement on the all-groove team for, by our last game at Hampton in a couple of, about three weeks. Sure we can. The uh, all-groove team is sponsored, as always, by Target. This is the first time that Target has ever graciously sponsored our all-groove team in the MEAC, and we're glad to have them on board. And just to give you just to give you a little flavor of the all-groove team. Is the groove team like anything like you? Smooth, chill, no beasts allowed. No beasts no allowed? No beasts allowed. That's, that's, a, that's a good groove team. <laughs> guys who formerly used to be Smith on the front. Chad Smith on the return. Across the 50. Not a bad return, Chad. We're coming back with much more of this game. 42 to 7 is our score. The Rattlers of FAMU lead. Action from William Dick Wright Stadium in Norfolk, Virginia. 42 to 7 is the score. And here are our Marine Corps players of the game. Damian Smith, young man, ran it in five yards for the touchdown for Norfolk State, but there's the young man who's having a huge game, Quinn Gray, but more importantly, he's gotten his confidence back, and that's what's mattered the most. And he'll need it next week as Hampton comes to town for a homecoming in Tallahassee. And they will test him. You know that. Boy, it's a great week, a uh, great schedule and next uh, you week. know, I love the way how it's going down the stretch, and obviously, you know, uh, all credit has to be given to these programs in the MEAC, how on any given Saturday, if you don't have your A game, you can lose. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt about that. But, I mean, next week you've got Bethune, Cookman, and North we, Carolina we, and and, and, and the thing and about Hampton. it is, the thing about it, you got to give credit, credit to the folks who decide which games are going to run on MEAC College Football Saturday. I mean, if you are a fan of the MEAC, and there are many MEAC fans out there, go to MEACFANSports.com and you'll find out. On the defense. Kills and refuse. Second down. And what has happened is that we've got some great games the next three weeks. Oh. I'm looking forward to it. North Carolina A&T and Bethune-Cookman at A&T's homecoming. Then followed up by what? Bethune-Cookman at Hampton and Hampton's homecoming. And then followed up by A&T at Hampton. Which could be for the conference title. Keeping you up to date and post a second and two. Smith tries for the first down, depending upon the spot. He might be into short. Well, let's talk about next week's contest, because those are two big championship-level uh, games with Florida A&M hosting Hampton University. We've seen both of those teams. Your impressions of uh, that contest going in, because I think that's a winnable game for Hampton down there. Almost oh, definitely. You know, uh, when you look at Kohler, you look at the mere fact that that offense can be stretched out. I mean, they've got Cash, who has come back since the mm -hmm. last time we saw him. And he's been able to find some receivers, part of that offense. And you look at the offensive categories, the MEAC, they're right there. Walter Amos going up top. Almost picked off. Well, we're going to have some pass interference on that one, big fella. And the guilty party for Florida A&M that time, I think, is going to be Shedrick Copeland. Well, Charles Burnett was the intended receiver. Burnett's a big name and a big guy. And you're absolutely right, Mark. It goes against the defense. Defensive pass interference, 15 yard penalty, automatic first down. All right, Sam Jones. Let's go to the standings, and as you can see, there's Bethune Cookman on top. 4-0 in the conference, 7-0 overall. Hampton 3-0, 5-1 overall. North Carolina A&T 3-0, 5-1. That one game where they couldn't score any points against Elon. And how about our next three games? There it is. We've been talking about it, hyping it up. Me at College Football Saturday. Tune in. We'll have the game for you. Just check your local listings. This will be a lot of fun.
the reverse. Ends it around. Burnett. Burnett at the 25. The 20. Right down at the 15-yard line. How about Mr. Amos? Famous Amos coming and leading that with a good block. Big fella built like a linebacker. He's going to get outside and pull like a guard. Watch number 12. He gives it off here, and then he's gone out to find somebody to hit. Here comes Burnett back the opposite way. See number 12 out there leading him. Is there somebody for me to block? Can I block somebody? There he is. And he springs his receiver down the near sideline for another five or six yards. Quarterback getting out there, getting into the mix of things. Not a quarterback, he's a football player. All right, 42 to 7. Under five minutes left to go. Aaron Culpepper. Culpepper was trying to turn up the speed. And he was met by a crew. We know what to do. Yeah, indeed. We talked last week, Ronnie, about great downfield blocking. Watch Sellers up here, number six. And he blew a block. If he's able to seal the back, the cornerback that time, it probably gives Culpepper the lane down the near sideline for the six. You know, I said this my first week working with you, and I have to admit, uh, not only are you a student of the game, I mean, it's just so much fun to work with you, Mark. And I'm not just blowing smoke, man. It is so much fun. I mean, I enjoy sometimes going back home and looking at a tape and going, man, Mark was really on it. First and ten. And once again. All right, Ronnie, now you did open the envelope already. The, check, the check is there, right? No, no, man, I'm serious. <laughs> I, I am very serious. I mean, the thing about it is that you love it. I mean, having been a product of Morgan State University, you've been around the, the MIAC all your life, from Baltimore, the whole nine yards. You've seen these schools. You know the history. And the commitment is there. You know, there are a lot of things, you know, people can be doing just to pick up a check. But what I'm saying is that not right. only are you doing it, but you're doing it because you know it. Dude, you, you, you certainly made it fun in your own, right? All right, second and 13 is our situation. And Mo Forte is trying to say, is there any more time left on this game? Can we go home? 42 to 7. Amos. Amos up deep. That's oh, interference. That's interference. It was intended for Sellers. And you can't hold on to him, big fella. You just can't do that. Look at that laundry. Boy. Man. Everybody's looking at it and sees it. Well, it looked like that time might have been Sequan Doe who was the one that was the guilty party. It was a prayer that was lofted, and sometimes prayers are answered by the receivers, and other times they're answered by the defensive backs. And that time, that was Turner. Fabian Turner, Turner. Fabian Turner, number 36. So at least Norfolk can look to some positives from the middle of the third quarter on that they can take from this game and for their sake build on yeah, this was definitely a step up game for them and they they weren't up to the challenge but coming in ronnie they've been outscored 56 to 3 in the first quarter and once florida and m got on the scoreboard it was going to be a long afternoon as smith finally takes it to the house for norfolk state so another small victory for the spartans and you know something you got admired in fortitude they have not packed it in you know what? You look at that picture that we were able to give you of Damian Smith talking to Coach Mo Forte and Forte telling him, look, it's going to be okay. True, we're losing this game, but somehow, some way, we're going to get better. Here's an interesting factor. Norfolk State had not lost at home this season. Right. This is their first loss at home this season, so they really thought point after is up and good. We'll come back and to finish this discussion. 42-14 is our score. FAMU in Norfolk State. Man, she plays the clarinet. She was playing at halftime. That's what they tell me. Look at her. How you doing, Jamila? And I know one thing. She looks like a star to me. I'll tell you what. You know her daddy, don't you? Pretty good. One of our outstanding videotape replay operators. One of the best in the business. I guess he figures he raised her young. She'll end up uh, as large as, I don't know, Ronnie Duncan is in Cleveland. Jamila Potien, a future star of the Mia. So now let's let, let's break down next week's contest. We, we 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 talked about it was a winnable game for Hampton and A&T. Now I am one up on you. There is time for you to roll it out once again. We can go double or nothing. I had A&T last week. Had A&T coming into the season. You went with Florida. We've got another Florida North Carolina matchup. What's up? Sky is up right now. <laughs> not not trying to step up and. Let's take a look at our target scores. <laughs> Delaware State beginning to roll. 14-6 over Morgan in the third quarter. 
Look at that. Hampton, 21. South Carolina State, 16 at the half. And North Carolina, A&T, leading 16 to 10 over Howard in the third. I Aggie guess. slowly but surely stepping it back up. Now, the question was, who will win the yeah. next Saturday's Bethune game? Bethune-Cookman versus North Carolina A&T. Hmm. Wishbone. The wide bone. Wide bone. And the A&T already lost one game. Jay Rogers, right? Jay Rogers, yes. Patel Troutman. Patel Troutman. And uh, we've got a battle between the two coaches, don't we? Eagles play a huge battle in this one, right? Yeah. because Bill Hayes and... Uh, yeah. Brother Wyatt. Well, all you need to know uh, to know about their warfare is that Bill, when he puts on his the snap, battle gear, ball starts, movement on the offensive line, five yard penalty, still third down. He finishes him with like athletic shoes and a sweat jacket. Alvin Wyatt will show up with lizard skin boots on. Alvin ready Wyatt to will work. show up to town and he will tell you there's a new sheriff in Greensboro <laughs> and his name is <laughs> Alvin <laughs> Wyatt. <laughs> And he'll be taking no prisoners. I tell you what, since it's double or nothing. Oh. <laughs> the bar bow. And the reception is good. DeMar Bow. I've been waiting to say DeMar's name right. all game long. DeMar, where have you been, big fella? Number 84. Well, he's another one of those Florida A&M injured his mom receivers. Cooks. Yes. We do know this much about DeMar Bow's mom. Legendary. He cooks for the team. We know this much. Had me looking for some eligibility last week. <laughs> I saw that training tape. Woo! Well, did you find any? A little bit. Well, this Bethune-Cookman A&T rivalry stems off a 76-7 A&T win over the Wildcats in 1996 that in Aggie Stadium. Week. That won't happen next week. Antoine back to pass. He finds the mark again, and this time he'll be about four yards short of a first down. So you know, anyway, let's go back to our little wager here, our little, mm -hmm. our little you know, competition. Yeah, tete -tete. Okay? All right, because you know we can't deal with money because you, no, you, you ain't got the green I got. That's right true. Now. You are large. <laughs> you got the big, fat TV bag. Shut up. <laughs> and I'm just a humble, struggling radio guy. Yeah, right. Hoping to keep the needles moving. <laughs> I tell you what, I'm taking Troutman and Rogers. All right. Oh, <laughs> oh fumble, but it's recovered by FAMU. Wow. That was like playing hot potato that time, it was. wasn't it? <laughs> and I looked at the situation. I, was like, from the, I went from a football game to a volleyball game in just a few right. seconds. You got to be good in this business, man. You really got to be good. I think at this time we need to give special thanks to the fine athletic staffs of these two schools for helping us with our preparation. Florida A&M's big man who is sports information director Alvin Hollins, but we also got to give big credit to his assistant, Kelly O'Neill. Visions of Sugar Plums can be dancing through your head this holiday season if you book the Nutcracker Package being offered by the Sheridan Norfolk Waterside Hotel from December, December 7th, 8th, or 9th. We're offering two prime tickets to see the Virginia Ballet Theater production of the holiday classic at the Chrysler Hall. Transportation to and from the show at the Chrysler Hall, an overnight guest room and one of the hotel's most heavily beds, overnight parking, and a MacArthur Center canvas tote bag. All this for $109, including tax, with additional persons only $20 each. Call 1-800-325-3535 or 757-622-6664 to book yours today. And speaking of dancing, well... That's hot ice. <laughs> that is hot ice. That's the name of the group. That's the name of the dance team, I know. Ronnie. That's what I'm saying. The name of the dance Okay. What, what do you think I was saying? <laughs> I, I just said wanted that's to make sure. I, I was identifying. Hey, that's Hot Ice. Okay. The name of the dance team. One of my good friends in Atlanta, Ken Beatty, hosts a show on WCLK that is called Hot Ice, Hot Ice in the Afternoon. You just had to mention his name, didn't you? He's my man. <laughs> You're lucky I didn't talk about my good friend Curtis Bunn, who is uh, one of the outstanding Ronnie baseball. Ronnie Farr with the quarterback sack. Speaking of hot, our next game is a hot one. Wow. Bethune Cookman. I am North pumped. Carolina A&T, Greensboro, next Saturday, 12 noon. Put now, up or shut up. Now, Donna Ware, the if SID you draw first, I'll shoot you down. Of, of <laughs> North Carolina A&T is telling everybody, wherever you're coming from, for all parts around in the Carolinas, a game starts at noon. 
<laughs> you're, if you're there at 1030, you may not find a place to park within, I don't know, seven, eight miles of the camp. So you need to, if you're partying early before that homecoming game, it's an early start this year. So, you know, make sure you've got plenty of antacid and aspirin and take so before the game. So that means I got to get you up early. <laughs> <laughs> Son, I'm going to spend quality time with my family. I'll also be spending a lot of time in the Christian Science Reading Room, brushing up on some, you know, metaphysical literature. <laughs> Anytime I bring up metaphysics, man, you get quiet. What's up with that, man? It's cool, man. <laughs> All blessings for you. <laughs> wow. Why'd you give me the big old Jimmy Swagger smack in the head? <laughs> Ball on the 49. <laughs> I'm all bruised now. I got a shiner. Eric Cole Pepper moving his way. He gets a first down. I tell you what, they're not going to stop. Even with just a few seconds on the clock, NSU wants to score again. 35 seconds left to go. We'd like to thank everybody. George Johnson once again doing an outstanding job on the sidelines. Uh, we also got to stop and give thanks to Chris Johnson and the sports information staff here at Norfolk State. And thanks to our crew in, in, in studio. Chris, my man from Minnesota. B.J. Evans making a trek from uh, Greensboro to hang out with us as our spotter. LeCount Conaway coming across the bridge to handle our stats. And we are about out of here. So uh, once again for George Johnson and, of course, Mark. I'm Ronnie Duncan, and we want you to join us again next week for North Carolina A&T's homecoming. Once again, the final score of this one, 42-14. FAMU wins as they continue their role in the MEAC. See you again next week, everybody.